Around the world and across Ghana's 16 regions, you're live on the AM show on Joy News, your home of independent, fearless and credible journalism. A gentle reminder that it's exactly 30 days to go for the 2024 presidential and parliamentary elections. Welcome to the AM show, AM show with me, Sweetie Abochi. Of course, I do this with Benjamin Akakwen, who joined us shortly. Now, this morning, why is the AM show worth waking up for? Because we were bringing you details and updates on every story in and around the country in our AM news segment. And after that, we'll sit with our guests to review the newspapers and the stories captured in there that resonates with me and you. After our news review segment, we'll bring you AM Sport. But who's coming for news review today? We have Remy Edmondson, the National Secretary of PPP, as well as Nanaya Sapom. He's political assistant to Alan Chermanteng. I'm an independent candidate from the um, Alliance for Revolutionary Change. And then our big stories begin. Now, this morning, we'll be looking at the Speaker of Parliament, um, Alban Bagbin's submissions yesterday. And he takes on the executive and judiciary accusing them of colluding to undermine the legislature and insisting no one will be allowed to destroy the institution. So shall we expect another stalemate from the NDC who are seeking to maintain their hold of the majority side of the House as Parliament is recalled today? What does this mean for governance and the state? You want to stick with us because we'll be bringing you details and del delve into those issues arising. Also today being a, a Thursday, we have AM Exclusive. And on that segment today, we'll bring you a fascinating interview with the British High Commissioner to Ghana, Harriet Thompson. And you don't want to miss our conversation with Benjamin Akaku. Folks, welcome aboard the AM News. But I'm inviting you to join the conversation right now across all social media handles. We are Joy News on TV. And later on, when we open the phone lines, you get a call and have your say. Many thanks for your time here. Let's start with the AM News now. This is the AM News with me, Sweetie Abochi. Let's get into the details. Now, the National Democratic Congress has rejected the Electoral Commission's final voter register shortly after the commission declared the document certified and fit for the general elections. The NDC requested for the summary statistics of the register before leaving the premises. What was expected to be done in a few clicks took more than six hours with the commission still unable to produce the summary statistics. The NDC later refused to accept the register while disputing the EC's claim that the register is certified. My colleague Michael Ashali was there and reports. We will today, Wednesday the 6th of November, present you with the soft copies of the final certified voters register for the 2024 general election. Chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Jan Mensa, says the EC has finally compiled the final voters' register after resolving all outstanding issues with the register. She proceeded to distribute the finalist register to representatives from political parties and independent candidates. It is finished. I present you with the final the copy of the final certified voters register for the 2024 election. What started out as a regular presentation of the final voters register to the various political parties and the candidates that will be standing in the December 7 polls soon turned chaotic. The NDC's Deputy Director of Elections and IT, Dr. Rashid Tanko, described the register as incomplete. Now, wouldn't want to solve the information. Because now you now want us to go and then look at this based on what you are talking about. Why not add that one to that certified, to make it certified? Because it appeared it's incomplete. Although initially reluctant to accept it, Dr. Tanko later collected a copy of the register, requesting the EC to provide a summary statistics of the register. We are not going to take it out unless they give us those statistics of which is part and parcel of the process. He also rejected the EC's use of the word certified register, insisting the law has been breached. The procedure of certifying the register, she mentioned Regulation 27. I thought she was going to read Regulation 27, 1, 2, 3, 
up to the four. There are four registered uh, under Regulation 27. It clearly stated how a, a register is to be satisfied. And one of it is that there is going to be formed an adjudication committee of which political parties are going to be part of it. Have you had any adjudication committee? And you are satisfying a register. The EC, in response, asked for some time to produce the summary statistics. After a six-hour wait, the commission returned with an apology. IT consultant to the Electoral Commission, Dr. Yao Ofori Ejei, explained that the process took longer than they expected. I apologize sincerely for the delay in getting you the statistics as was promised. Commissioner Jean Mensah says the request is not grounded in law and the EC cannot be forced to grant it. If you choose to return it, that's your prerogative. You can do so. And you, this is a request you are making. It is not binding in law. I mean, we are not obliged to give it to you. But I think as a commission that believes in transparency, that accommodates and is responsive to the needs of its stakeholders, we don't have a problem generating the detailed summary to you. For you, but we are not obliged. This drew the anger of some political parties. The NDC returned the hard disk drive containing the voters' register, insisting they will only accept it alongside the requested summary statistics. If they don't bring the, 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 this thing, the ballot statistics or the, the voter statistics and, and the summaries, we are not going to take the register. We've returned it. We have officially said we have returned the drive back to them until we get the summaries. What is she talking about? Nana Giao Sapon, representing Alan Tramantin, says the EC's posture leaves much to be desired. Personally, I see that as the commission being so disrespectful to us. We, I see that as the commission not taking us serious, they are just taking us for granted. Basically, that is what it is. You understand. Meanwhile, the NPP, represented by Evans Nimaku, said they were satisfied with the process and will give the EC additional time to provide the summary statistics. On the part of New Patriotic Party, we'll keep our time. And we hope that the one I given or by tomorrow, we'll have uh, the copy so that our IT people can then look at it. The Electoral Commission is racing against time now to produce the summary statistics that they promised to hand over to the various political parties and the candidates that will stand in the December polls. After six hours, they have asked for more time. Only time will tell when exactly they will be able to produce this. For Joy News, Michael Ashale. Speaker of Parliament, Alban Bagbin, says there is a grand agenda by both the executive and judiciary to weaken and undermine the Parliament of Ghana. In a no holds barred press conference to address recent controversies over the declaration of some seats vacant, Aban Bagbin described the recent development as a power play and an interference in both the executive and the judiciary to interfere in the duty of parliament. And the speaker claimed the conduct of both arms are destabilizing Ghana's democracy. And our parliamentary affairs correspondent, Kweku Asante, tells us more. Speaker of Parliament Alban Bagwin has broken his silence on this controversy surrounding his declaration of four seats as vacant. The matters have ended up at the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court has made interim orders. The Speaker of Parliament instructed his lawyers to take the matters up in the Supreme Court to have those rulings made by the Supreme Court vacated. The court rejected that position. The Speaker of Parliament, speaking for the first time in an interaction with journalists in Parliament, said it appears there is a collusion between the executive and the judiciary to weaken parliament. The current brouhaha may be likened to a power play between the arms of government. Recent acts of the judiciary and executive, and I see them as interference in the workings of parliament, pose a direct challenge to the essence, jurisdiction, authority, powers, and functioning of the esteemed institution of parliament. The judiciary and the executive are seemingly colluding to weaken parliament. The Speaker of Parliament says, despite the NPP not having enough numbers to actually run their business through, as we have seen in previous parliament, he and the NDC MPs have bended over backwards sometimes to allow government business through. 
The NDC members of parliament, however, understood the situation and on a daily basis cooperated with the MPP members of parliament to see government business through. In spite of this, the NDC members are said to be saboteurs of government business. The Speaker of Parliament says some of these matters that have ended up at the Supreme Court could have been handled maturely in Parliament. He says both the President and the Supreme Court have sinned against the Constitution of Ghana. The powers of the judiciary ends where the nose of Parliament starts. The Constitution is very clear on freedom of speech and of proceedings of Parliament. This was exhibited by the President's refusal to even receive the LGBTQ plus bill, duly processed and passed by Parliament without any legal basis. The judiciary is supported of this conduct by the receipt and processing of a suit on this subject matter. These are dangerous precedents in our democratic journey. Both the president and the judiciary have sinned against the constitution and must seek the opportunity to confess and repent to be forgiven. Alban Bagwin does not believe justice has been done in this case. He cites other issues when the Supreme Court actually decided to block members of parliament from actually coming to the, to the house to represent their constituents and said, where will there be justice if at this point in time you say these MPs whose seats have been declared vacant cannot represent their constituents? Justice must not only be done, but must be seen to be done in all cases. Not in only those cases to which some people appear to be sentimentally attached. Fellow Ghanaians, I respectfully call on the Supreme Court to apply the same swiftness with which the motion ex party in the Eastern matter was granted to the case involving the president refusal to receive the human rights and family values bill. You will recall that the Attorney General in court did say that the Speaker of Parliament had committed a crime by illegally procuring the services of Tadio Sori. The Speaker of Parliament has been firing back. He's the Attorney General. He did his service in Parliament here. <laughs> I was leader then yes. when he was doing his service here. Yes. So I know him very well before he became Attorney General. There's vast difference between Parliament as an institution and the office of the Speaker. Once I'll meet the Attorney General and I'll tell him my peace of mind <laughs> on some legal issues and pronouncements he made at the Supreme Court. During that same proceedings at the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Gertrude Tokono did indicate that it appeared to her that there was a constitutional crisis. The Speaker of Parliament says nothing of that sort is happening currently in the country. There is no constitutional crisis in this country. The Parliament of Ghana is alive and working. Let nobody mislead misinform or disinform you and the country. So what exactly is going to happen in the House tomorrow in terms of the seating arrangement? The Speaker of Parliament says that is not his job. It is said to be a showdown again tomorrow because both sides are taking entrenched positions, calling themselves the majority, with the NBC MPs clearly signaling their intent to take the right-hand side of the Speaker of Parliament. Reporting for Joy News, Kweku Asante, Parliament House, Accra. Well, away from Parliament, President Okufado has disclosed that the Agenda 111 project was the big idea of Dr. Mahmoud Baumia. He said Dr. Baumia approached him in his office during the COVID-19 pandemic 
and suggested the construction of hospitals in districts without hospitals. Now, the president made these remarks during his thank you tour of the central region. And there's more in the following reports by central regional correspondent Eric Asante. Addressing the chiefs and people of the central region, President Ekufuado outlined projects and programs that his government had put in place for the improvement of health care. He said more than 70% of the entire Agenda 111 project had been completed, while the rest were at various stages of completion. The president expressed the hope that he would inaugurate some of the hospitals before his tenure of office ends on January 7, 2025. <laughs> I just said, 260 districts are what Ghana. There are 88 districts are in the district hospital. And you are telling me, say, okay, you have to say, you say, boom, what? That says that one third of Ghana, 88 to 260, one third, one third of Ghana population in Yakwai. In your, uh, sorry, when they need it most during this pandemic. The and the 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 kind of human being we're dealing with in the NPP presidential candidate, Muhammad Baumia. And you'll be a Ghana. Ghana sent down the Kumas of the average in the central region. It's like the national average, 70% complete. That's on Yanko Pong Pressoir, and Sam and Missy Forward. Several of these hospitals will be commissioned before I leave in two months. On the achievement of his government, the president said the free SHS policy had increased the country's SHS enrollment from 800,000 in 2017 to 1.6 million. Additionally, he said a total of 5.7 million young people had benefited from the free SHS policy since its introduction. In 2017, basically, 800,000 students, and my that tour was secondary school, we bought in 2017. And the number now has doubled. It's now 1.6 million students in our junior secondary school system. 5.7 million young Ghanaians in the senior, senior, free senior high school policy in the whole 5.7 billion beneficiaries of it. I know this year enrollment, the highest enrollment in the history of our country, over 500,000, and no encounter. It's only a no now it's 6.2 million Ghanaians in policy. The president took a jab at former president John Mahama, calling him as not trustworthy. He said the people of the central region should not give John Mahama the opportunity to rule the country again. No, the president said we are not now move from no one or power or can we say flip, flop, flop, flip, flip, flop. We have no any 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 man. We don't want a leader like that. Somebody who talks from both ends of his mouth is not fit to lead this country. On her part, the Central Region Minister Marigold Hassan thanked the president for the development in the region. We are very grateful unto the president and we say that we just want to admire him. 
we are told him, we are appreciative of what he has done for the central region. In some of the brain of my penny, why he was a few months old. Me, Jimmy, is there who per se might say, who saw my work, what it would be, a fun, a fun, on cherry crown or the drink machines to become home. On one, my same be a wire contractor for assembly, they are the full complement of equipment for the assemblies to work on our roads. President Ekufuado thanked the chiefs and people in the central region for reposing their trust in him and supporting his administration to succeed. For Joy News, my name is Erika Santi, Cape Coast. Now, the people of Serugu in the Bogatanga municipality of the Upper East region have expressed their frustration and disappointment towards the government and Arako Construction Limited for the prolonged neglect of the bogatanga sherugu Naga Road project. At a press conference, community leaders said the people of Sherugu would no longer tolerate being overlooked and demanded that the road be completed by the end of the year. Correspondent Albert Sori reports. 30.85 km bogatanga sherugu Naga Road connects the Bolgatanga and Kasana Nankana municipalities and is essential to the socio-economic growth of the two municipalities. However, since the contract for this road project was awarded to Arako Constructions Limited in 2018, it has experienced significant delays, leaving the road in a hazardous condition that threatens public health and safety throughout the year. In the dry seasons, Inhabitants have to contend with the high concentration of dust from this untarred road and during the rainy seasons, the road is extremely muddy, slippery and almost impossible to ply. Here are some users of the Bolgatanga Shirugu Naga Road. Look at this road. This road is so muddy. In fact, look at my mother's. A mother moving to school came and fell here. She got up, she was not cleaning herself. Look at my sanders. Look at this road. Then we claim we should vote. When we vote, so we don't pay tax. The state of this road has really made me very, very, very crazy. Like, I'm crazy. In fact, crazy. This road is spoiling our can do spoiling. In fact, people are falling. Not only us, but as school children. When they are going to school, some fall here. They don't have enough children to go back. So what do we do? Even us, we that pick the people from here to town. When there's a pregnant woman, when we are going, we suffer. Normally when we drive, it will get to a time, it will not even get long. Most of our can-do spare parts will be weak do, do, uh, because of this route. So we are here pleading with the government that if only he will find a way out that we will make this route good for us. The people of Shirugu want the road completed by the end of this year. Stephen Akugre speaks for them. We believe it is time for the government to hold the, the contractor accountable for, for his actions. The people of Sirico, Naga, Tanzu, Nsoka, BC, Zobisi, and the surrounding community will not tolerate any further delay. No. No. We are giving the government and the contractor 10 days uh, ultimatum. Started from today yes. Yes. to take decisive action. If Araku, the Araku Construction Limited, fail to return to the site and resume work within this period, we will have no choice but to organize protests against we deserve them. better. This pro uh, protest will not be a mere demonstration of frustration. It will be a powerful message to the government and the contractor that the people of Sirigu and the affected community will no longer accept being neglected and disregarded. For Joy News, Albert Sorry, Sirigo. Let's do some other stories now. The Ghana Statistical Service, in collaboration with Takrade Technical University, has launched the 2024 Statistical Data Hackathon Competition, a unique platform for students to leverage data for real-world solutions. The competition aims to promote data literacy and innovative approaches in tackling socioeconomic challenges. Our reporter, Inatalia Kwanza, tells us the story from Takrade.
Six technical universities are cheering up to compete in the 2024 Statistical Data Hackathon, a competition designed by the Ghana Statistical Service. The hackathon encourages students to apply data skills to real-world challenges. Dean of the Takradi Technical University's Faculty of Applied Science, Professor Drew Texan, highlighted how hackathons like this can inspire breakthrough innovations. We will subject the teams to uh, two, three hours of trying to make sense of data. Data will be available for them from the Stats Bank. So all they are going to do is to make sense of the data, generate ideas from the data, or if you like, um, uh, bring about an innovative dashboard using the data, so that once the data changes, the result would just appear. So the Statistical Hackathon means a lot to Takwadi Technical University because uh, it, is, it is the first of its kind. So if we are one of the six technical universities competing in this statistical hackathon, then we need to be proud of it. So Takwadi Technical University is proud of this statistical hackathon. And uh, I believe sincerely that our students have prepared themselves well uh, to to win, you know, in fact, even to win at the national level. In a competitive 36-hour session, five teams will compete to secure one of the top three sports and move to the national level where they will face five other technical universities. Winners will take home cash prize with top prize set at 5,000 Ghana cities. Dr. Francis Kweku Sripi, the National Hackathon Coordinator, explained that the goal is to boost students' practical skills in data analysis and problem solving. We are going to engage our students for 36 hours to use the Stars Bank data that we have to develop um, innovative products. And this product that I want to develop should span around the SDGs. They address issues on sanitation, issues on housing, issues on employment, issues on health issues. At the end of the day, the best way from this university will meet again to further develop their products. And after developing their products, will upscale their products to um, invite other um, stakeholders to come and see what they have done. And our best, this product can solve issues that we are facing as a nation. You all agree with me that you cannot develop without using data. It is very important for us to take decisions based on the data that we have at our disposal. The competition blending data science and creativity holds the promise of new insights and impactful solutions for Ghana's socioeconomic development. For Joy News in Athalia, Kwanza, Western Region. President of the Animation Association of Ghana, Samuel Kote, speaking on the sidelines of the launch of the Guardian's animated film series, has urged Ghanaian creatives to take full advantage of the new technologies available to enhance their creative skills in animation. There's more in this report. Animation has evolved significantly since its inception in 1892 when French inventor Charles Emile Renault revolutionized the art form by being the first to project animated cartoons for a public audience in Paris. Over the years, numerous innovations have transformed animation, evolving from simple hand-drawn sketches to today's breathtaking digital masterpieces. Established in 2002 by the International Animated Film Association, a branch of UNESCO, International Animation Day is celebrated annually on October 28. The day aims to inspire new talent and honor the vibrant world of animation. Jesse Sunkwa Mills, creative director at Mills Media, speaking at the launch of the Guardian's animated film series, has called on organizations to invest in the industry, emphasizing its potential to drive business growth. In, in recent years and for a while, the, I mean, the French you know, Institute has been of great support, the French Embassy, 
they have really supported animation in the past years and they still do. It's, it's great time for us to, to, to actually be in the space. The industry is growing, um, it's getting better than it used to be before. Um, there are a lot more people getting into the space, a lot more studios, a lot more freelancers and it's growing as compared to back in the days. Of course, a lot has to also do with the influence of um, technology. So it's made production of animation, well, I won't say easier, but a lot more better than it used to be before. Um, a lot more people are able to get into the space now because the tools we use for animation are better as compared to back in the day. The simulation of movement created by a series of pictures is animation. But how it actually works is a bit more complicated than that. Samuel Corte, president of the Animation Association of Ghana, explains the strides that have been made in the animation industry in Ghana. Um, eight years ago, like I said earlier on, we, we, we decided to support um, our, our members who had studios that wanted to produce future films, support them and help them produce their films and see how we can market them. It's come out well, we've had the Crossroads, we've had Ana, um, Asantua, uh, we had Rise, and currently we have The Guardians. So we can say for sure that uh, looking at the numbers, we've, we've increased our, the numbers, the audience that would want to watch a local animation film. In the last 10 years ago, if you were going to do a local admission for me, I'm not sure to find people coming in to watch. Thankfully, uh, we've been able to work this thing out. And, and at the last screening of a local admission from at the silver bed, we had all the halls at the silver bed full. Animation has made significant strides since its inception in 1892 when French inventor Charles Emile Renault first transformed the art form. Stephen Mensah's report read to you. Welcome to business. Now, the marginal reduction in the food inflation rate over the past two months was still not enough to slow inflation, uh, the, the inflationary rate increment for the month of October 2024. There is more in this report. Fiscal service data showed that the prices of some food stuff like vegetables, cereals, tubers, plantain, and cooking oil actually went down by some significant margin from September to October this year. However, the weight of these items in the food inflation basket were not enough to significantly slow the rate of inflation for the month of October 2024. Data from the Ghana Statistical Service also showed that general price levels of other food items also went down by some significant margin during that period. But despite the current challenges with the Ghana city, import inflation had been dropping over the past months to 16.3%, but inflation of items produced locally was however going up. Some have argued that if the month-on-month -month numbers are anything to go by, then they could argue that there is the likelihood that the trend could be slowing down in the coming month when it comes to the inflation rate. However, one is not sure if government could end the year meeting its revised inflation target for 2024. Now, Ghana's crude oil production has seen a significant return to positive outcomes in the first half of the year as production surpassed that of the same period last year. According to the semi-annual report of the Public Interest and Accountability Committee, the increase was influenced by the coming on stream of the new uh, well-known of the new well known as the Jubilee Southeast. In financial terms, Ghana received $840.7 million in the first half of the year as against $540 million within the same period in 2023. Chairman of the committee, Constantine Kujeji, explains. Total revenue for the, year, for the half year for these three fields come to $840,765,265.80 US dollars. And the breakdown from the various fields are also indicated. The Jubilee field, which produces more oil had 248.646.664.31. The SGN was the next uh, in terms of gas, especially 149.108236 million US dollars. And then the 10 field had 76 
520109 million dollars so that's the revenue for half year 2024 now by this chart we are showing you the total revenue from our oil production since 2012 to half year 2024 and so far since 2011 we have raked in 10 billion 10.69 billion barrels sorry uh, billion dollars in terms of revenue from our oil production now if you look at the chart you will see that for this year half year we have raked in the highest revenue so far which is 840.77 million um, barrels so basically if you look at it this year this half year is better in terms of revenue as against last year which was 540 million dollars if you look at last two years it was 731 okay which was even more than last year so last year was worse but this year is better and in fact better than all other years Good morning again. We are live on the news review segment for this morning. And Benjamin Akaku, of course, is here with me. And shortly we'll be introducing our guests. But first, I want to tell you about this year's Compu Ghana cashback that um, has been named as Prime Cashback Season. And it's packed with incredible deals and exciting surprises. Now, this Prime Cashback um, Compu Ghana is bringing you exclusive discounts, prime savings and awesome surprises when you shop products from any of their branches nationwide. You can find products from your favorite brands like Samsung, LG, TCL, HP, Lenovo, Dell, Media, Nasco, Techno, Infinix, Itel, Huawei, and many more. Visit any of CompuGana branch na branches nationwide and enjoy exclusive discounts on our products. Now, CompuGana has a wide range of IT-related products, mobile phones and electronic devices such as laptops, printers, desktops, mobile phones, tablets, televisions, all that you can think about, air conditioners, gas cookers and more. So what's more amazing is this year's Prime Cashback with CompuGana has got great prizes with instant gifts and cash prizes for your shopping experience. So when you shop at CompuGana this season, be on the lookout for the surprise team answer a question correctly, and win instant cash and gifts. You deserve this opportunity too. So rush to CompuGana now. Promo runs from now till December. So visit CompuGana.com or call 0302-752-020 for more information. And Benjamin will tell you more. Well, I'm also going to be telling you about Medicas Hospital, a modern healthcare facility built with your recovery in mind. And they have spacious wards built with your family in mind, a warm and caring pediatric unit built with your children in mind. And they've also assembled some of the brightest minds in medicine led by Dr. Yosafo, the drive time doctor, to serve you. In, in addition, they are offering general medical services as well as specialist services in plastic surgery, obstetrics and gynecology, child health, urology, psychiatry and eye care but there's still more they are offering a comprehensive medical diagnostic service encompassing the following endoscopy medical laboratory services x-rays and scans and if you're thinking of where you're going to get all your medication well they also have a 24-hour pharmacy ensuring you'll receive efficacious safe and affordable medicine and they are bringing to you the most powerful medicine of all you know what simple human kindness and empathy and they pride themselves on holding themselves to the highest attainable standards. They accept all forms of payment as well. So don't worry if you don't have cash to go through. They also accept private health insurance as well. So you're sorted out. Where can you find Medicus Hospital? They are located at number 10 Kinso Street near the Ashale Boche School Junction. If you'd like to call them, which I suggest you do, the number to call is 0501 477 340. 0501 477-340. On social media, they are at Medicast GH. Medicast Hospital, a place of healing. 
But time now for us to get our guests into the picture uh, this morning. And we have joining uh, the conversation, Nanayao Sapong, of course, he is with the Alad Trevor team, uh, team. And we also have Remy Edmondson, who is with the CPP, joining PPP, I beg your pardon, joining the conversation uh, this morning. Gentlemen, a very good morning to you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, good morning sweetie. Good morning, sweetie. Nice. How are you? I'm fabulous. It's been a while. Yeah. So let's get into your um, minutes, two minutes max take on any topical issue that you want to reflect on. Um, Nanaya Sapon. So now, the way you're smiling this morning. Uh, He's going to parliament, so she let him uh, <laughs> really. <laughs> He's going to parliament? Yes, yes, you don't know. I saw his posters all over. <laughs> and oh, I don't know which, which, yes. which constituency. Domi Kwame, constituency. Domi Kwame, yeah. yeah. Oh, so you're going yeah. uh, head to head with um, Michael Quay Jr. That's right. And That's right. Um, who, who's the NDC? NDC is being represented by uh, Faustina Lipi Makrugu. Ah, okay, right that's now. that's a constituency. Yeah. I see. Yes. Yes. Yeah. What what I'm going to put you to the, the the test here. What do you think realistically are your chances? It's the, Domi it's, it's, is it's a quite constituency open. that yes. you know has. You know, you know, there have been. It's quite open this time around. Um, it is. We've had an, it, yes, predominantly it's been um, an MPP seat since the constituency was carved out, and um, after Professor Michael Quay's eight years, I just have also. Had it for about eight years. She mm -hmm. she re still retains quite some support, and now that she's not in the race, I mean it's quite open. I mean that's a fact on the ground. So we all have to work hard. And given the economic situation and uh, people's disaffection with the government, in fact most people actually don't want to vote. And this I is see. a fact across the board. Yes. So we all are, have to do, are still doing a lot of talking, a lot of house to house, a lot of engagement to convince people why they need to come out and vote and vote for us. Yeah. Okay. And, and before you get into your one minute thing, I, I just saw this as well, which I'd like to, because you are talking about promises and this government, mm -hmm. the president says he's delivered 80% of their manifesto promises. As both of you talk about your thoughts, maybe you can sneak in thoughts on that. Who's going first? You? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll do that. So um, I'll first start by, I want to just I have some good news to share with, with Ghanaians, with the country. Um, on behalf of the PPP, I want to thank them all for their support. Over the weekend on Sunday in Casablanca, I was elected the new vice president for West Africa, for the Africa Liberal Network. Wow. It's a coalition Congratulations. of parties that Congratulations. Uh, the PPP, you know, uh, we subscribe to the liberal ideology. So mm. uh, the ALN, Africa Liberal, is a network of political parties all over Africa who subscribe to that ideology. So um, it's, my term will be for two years, and I'm looking forward to work with. In Ghana, it's PPP and then the LPG. We're the okay. two liberal parties in Ghana, yes. All so right. we'll be working together to, I mean, help influence our politics and help member parties across the country grow, the, 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 the continent actually, and then help uh, build Africa into uh, what we want. Right. Yeah, so, uh, but on this, on that take, um, I, I, I <laughs> why do you disagree? I disagree so much. I mean, um, it's, 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 you see, it's one thing to talk. I don't know, they ask the other Ghanaian, if they feel these, these manifesto promises. It's now down to bread and butter issues. And, and look, trust me, I'm sure you are general, you, you talk to people. If you go to the ground, people are so, so disappointed. And we are not talking members of the opposition. We are talking members, diehard hard core members of the ruling MPP, mm. who are just so disappointed and regret bringing their own government into power. And what they are saying is that they don't even want to vote. They, are not even, they don't even want to vote for their own. You know what? I got a call before I traveled. I got a call from a woman who told me she was a former organizer of the MPP. And she has organized people to go and vote for. Guess who? Cheddar. But they don't have a, 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 a parliamentary candidate. Now I, I put a phone number on my posters. So people call. So she wants, wants wanted us to meet so that they can discuss how they can give me their votes. This is the reality on the ground. Wow. It is, it is, it is a, they, they, this government has completely disappointed all Ghanaians, including their own people. And so I don't expect him. Well, he may be saying that he's, he's got a few, a few days, about 30 days to, to go. Yes, he will be saying this to feel good. I saw yesterday he started uh, <laughs> inaugurating a status of himself. <laughs> As they say, <laughs> he better does it himself before he goes out in case nobody decides to do it for him when he leaves. So. Uh, I, I don't believe in those, uh, <laughs> those claims of having fulfilled 80. We are not feeling it, and uh, we don't want promises, we want reality. All right. Um, Good. Thank you very much. Um, 
I, I, when was the last time you went to the market? Me, yeah. personally? Yes. Uh, maybe about a little over a month. Oh, that's too long. Shudi? No, I haven't been in a while. You know the price of a crate of egg now? 66. Tell me. It's now about 70, 70. Really? Yes. Yeah. It's got to 70? Yes. That is how much. But you know there are different types. Yeah. There are different sizes. Talking different, about so what are, what are you talking about? So which size, which 60 city size were you talking about? The last time I bought a crate of egg, I got it for 60 city. Yes, I the normal crate it. of egg is now 70, 75. But you know why I'm asking? Usually when you go, there Those, are smaller the, the, sizes. The ones, there are bigger the sizes. The ones, Sometimes even they will the, tell you the brown and the yes, white. The brown, and, that's why I'm so asking. So I'm talking you. about the average price of an egg, an egg, a crate, crate of, of eggs. egg now. And... I just want to say that the bread and butter issue is what Ghanaians are looking at now. I mean, with all the struggles we go through, if we are not able to afford food on our table, if we are not able to afford water, it means that things are really getting tougher. And if you've been buying bread recently, you will notice that the bread you used to buy for 15 Ghana cents. Yes. It's now 25 cities. It's 30 cities in. No, I'm, 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 I'm coming. It depends on the area you are in. Yeah. All right? My area, the bread I was buying for 15 cities yes. is now 30 cities. Yeah. And if you mistakenly bypass the vans and walk into the, yeah, shop, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, mass, the mats, all right, you are going to buy it for 32 to 35 Ghana yeah. cities. And yeah. that is how expensive bread has become. I have a place I buy my favorite cocoa. Now the cup of the cocoa and that sliced bread with the kosher, you can't go We all know kosher. <laughs> you know, in that would now, it's, it's, it's now in the ranges of 20 to 25 cents. And so how would the ordinary Ghanaian feed? I mean, well, yesterday when I was having a discussion, somebody told me that we the Ghanaians are the cause and that they were making a whole lot of philosophical analysis. But at the end of the day, I think that something ought to be done to be able to bring bread and butter to the table of the ordinary Ghanaians. It's Things are getting too expensive lately. It's affecting everybody. And it's showing, even in our inflationary rates, it in the last two months, we've seen uptakes. Everybody. You may say... It's minimal 0.7%, but still, it, it's right for, 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 you see, when we have these conversations, we are not having them mostly for middle class or middle yeah. upper class. No, for people, the ordinary right? Ghanaian. Yeah. Because those who feel it the it's, most it's, 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 are those who are yeah. earning how much? And you see, in the same country, we have to conclude this and get to the papers, but in the same country, right? We say there's something called minimum wage, where the tripartite committee will sit down and <laughs> fix. But, while I'm not mentioning any company's name, some of those who sweep the streets <laughs> and the rest, mm -hmm. ask them how much they earn in a month. And some of them yeah, have yes. backlogs yeah. for how some long. Months. And some of these malls, okay? Malls from other countries. Again, I'm not mentioning, I, sometimes I don't want to stereotype. No, no, they, they pay between 800 to 1,000, some, some less. Eh? Some people are 500. taking 300, 400, 500. Yeah. It's, it's, and we are not even enforcing the minimum wage, wage so that yeah. people are paid mm -hmm. well. You see, <clears throat> the point is that you have made the laws. You are not able to enforce it because you have not created the jobs. Hmm. You have not created it. It's just like when people talk about rent. Uh, but wait, oh, they, they, they mentioned yeah. they've created over 2 million so, jobs. <laughs> Government says it has created Those over 2 million so, jobs. So, Some will even tell you as many as 3 million jobs. Yeah, so when, when Alan made up his mind that he would be creating 3 million jobs, you know what he did? He went further to create an app to gather the sectorial and industrial areas where jobs are needed and where vacancies are. So he created the 3MJ. So if you Google 3MJ, 3 million jobs, it opens up and then it gives you that Alan Tremantin app that you're able to load, up, upload your CV. Now, the main brain behind it is for us to be able to gather the data, look at the avenues available and push it, create that incentive for these companies. So if you look into our youth agenda, what, we are doing, what we'll be doing is that we would give opportunities to these companies to recruit fresh graduates 
to recruit people who have stayed home for so very long, and then we will give them both physical and non-physical benefits Assistance. to be able to help them to expand their businesses. If you are not expanding these businesses, and you are saying you've created jobs. I mean, oh mommy, we will you know Oh mommy, we will not say we you know for more. At the end, we will see who will be hungry, and that is the reality we are facing today. Is it possible anyway. that these, jo these jobs have actually been created, and we don't know the people who um, are benefiting from? If the these jobs, jobs are that's... created, sweetie, you belong to a community, you belong to a, a society, you belong to a home. Yeah. You would hear because definitely somebody will get a job. Somebody will be recruited. Somebody who has been sending you WhatsApp messages and asking you, sweetie, how are you? And when you mistakenly respond, I am fine. Then the person will go like, oh, Minya, you know, today I have not eaten. Uh, can you send me something? Those messages will stop. You see? Does it ever really stop? Let me, let me tell you. you know, this. It says if the fundamentals no, it, it, are... It, it is that if you had 100 this people really, who would yeah. be reaching out, mm -hmm. probably it would fall to about it, it 70. Will, yes, it will reduce. Okay. But has it reduced? No, it keeps <clears> increasing. So if the fundamentals are weak, the exchange will, will expose you. Okay, guys, I think we should get into the yeah. papers <laughs> now. Let me start. I like to start. Um, okay, so I have the New Republic and the Anchor. Let me start with the New Republic. A tale of two one-term presidents. Oh, the comparisons. Trump is back. Is JM coming? That's on the front page. Um, energy sector in debt crisis. There is no constitutional crisis, Alban Bagbin says. And... Um, Highway, highways workers in major revolt. So let me get into it straight away from presidency yours for the taking. Chala chief tells Mahama, highways workers in major revolt. So that is the Ghana Highways Authority. Let me just get a bit of this. In an unprecedented display of resistance, employees of the Ghana Highway Authority are on the verge of a nationwide industrial action threatening to cripple Ghana's road sector over the contested implementation of the National Roads Authority um, Act 2024. And the simmering crisis, which has been brewing for weeks, has now escalated into a critical point as workers issue stark ultimatums to government officials. Just to give us a bit of context on what that is. So a tale of two one-term precedents. I like this one. Trump is back. Is JM coming back? Is a question I'm posing to you, gentlemen. Um, it's economy. Okay, the, the, the wording here. It's economy stupid. I don't want to get into this. Kamala Falls, Baumier's <coughs> neck. So it's, it looks like everybody's um, trying to skew the, Trump's victory in their own favor. The NDC says it means JM is coming back. NPP says it means Dr. Mahmoudou Baumia is coming. Nobody knows. Supreme Court's ruling on vacant parliamentary seats questions legal precedents, Chachuchi Kata says. The Ghanaian um, Supreme Court's recent involvement in resolving parliamentary vacancies has ignited a wide-ranging debate, soliciting opinions from legal experts, constitutional scholars, activists, and public at large. In the midst of these discussions, Chachuchi Kata, a highly esteemed legal practitioner and statesman, has criticized the Supreme Court's decision regarding Speaker Bagbane's announcement of four vacant seats. And his examination raised concerns, about, that is strategic Chikata's examination, raised concerns about potential deviations from established legal precedents um, that interferes with the boundaries of the Supreme Court's authority and the implications of the ruling on parliamentary autonomy and constitutional interpretation. Because of this story, I want to skip to where we have Alban Bagbane's um, speech yesterday just to give us a bit we will get into that later on on the show this morning so you want to say with us <clears throat> that story is on page 14 and i'll get to it right away there is no constitutional crisis bagbin flares the chief justice so the speaker of parliament alban bagbin has strongly rejected efforts by the executive and judiciary to evidently weaken the authority of the legislature and speaking at a press con press speaking to the press yesterday ahead of the recall of parliament today the speaker voiced his opposition to these actions stating quote it is becoming increasingly apparent that the judiciary and the executive are seemingly collaborating to diminish parliament and yesterday when you listen to the speaker i think that's the last story i'll do from the new republic gentlemen it it, it sounds to me as if the speaker has invited all of us onto this intellectual um, playground because 
We've, we're listening to so many arguments, and everybody is arguing in the favor of whatever they think is right, their own interpretations of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And he cites many instances where the same Article 97 um, Clause 1 G has been had been interpreted in the past, and nobody had any issue with it. He made he, you know he cited instances where members of Parliament who are supposed to be loyal to Parliament <laughs> are running to the Supreme Court, are running to the judiciary. The question on my mind is, what is the bigger argument now? We've listened to we've listened to the speaker. He didn't hold back. He said everything that he wanted to say. What argument beats his at this point? Personally, no argument beats what the speaker mm. said. All right. Now, what is happening in Parliament is this Adidi mm. saying, if you're a dream, you understand. When one party had so many MPs and that losing one MP had no effect on them, they were very okay with whichever interpretation was given to this article. All right. But now that it's it has an effect on their stance in parliament. Mm. Then they have issues with this interpretation. This is black and white. Okay. You understand? And the Supreme Court, you know, when this whole bruhaha came, Alan made a, sta a press statement and he said that, listen, he doesn't have any issue with the orders that have been given by the Supreme Court. But if these orders have to be implemented or executed, it only would have to, it can be executed when there is a sitting of parliament, all right? And the NPP walked out of parliament. Now you've recalled parliament. There is a ruling in parliament, and that one would have to stay until parliament is able to take a decision, a binding decision. And so the question is, where would you go and sit today? Are you going to sit on the minority side, or are you going to sit on the majority side? Let us be real with ourselves. Okay. There, there are precedents that have been set. We all know there is a substantive issue in, Pal uh, in, in Supreme Court now. What is happening to that substantive issue? If indeed the Supreme Court was interested in resolving what is happening, and if it is not the issue of power struggle and interference, by now, that interpretation would have been out because it's very critical. But we leave it wanting Parliament to do what? To to execute the order first before we go on to the main case? Okay. Oh. Vote for me. Um, Remy. Yes, sir. I think the, the biggest takeaway from his uh, press conference yesterday was, um, yeah, he sounded a lot about the need to protect the, 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 the separation of powers. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, I mean, yes, from his perspective, um, it's rather unfortunate that for him to have said, which is quite worrying and serious for me, that um, the, the executive and the judiciary are actually colluding. Um, to weaken legislature. And so for me, for all Ghanaians, right wing Ghanaians, it's, 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 I like one thing he said was that this, this for him, it's about he's trying to preserve this for yeah. future generations. And I think that's very important. All of us have to be quite concerned about. Um, there was a reason why the framers of the Constitution uh, framed it this way. So that, I mean, the idea was that each of these arms would serve as a check on each other. And so we begin to have the situation where one arm seems to be having some undue influence or want, wanting to exert some undue influence, then it's quite worrying for our democracy, the future of our democracy for the years to come. Um, yes, it's, it's rather worrying um, that, um, like my brother said, one party, when it suited them well a few years ago, were very okay um, for this kind of ruling, but now the tables have turned, and, and I think it's also time that we look at the nature of our politics. I mean, our partisan politics is really, really hurting us. We have MPs going to parliament, and, and then the business of parliament is not done based on what the people, the interests of the people who put them into parliament want, and what will be in their interest. It is all about being flipped into line to just follow uh, a particular party's agenda. And so if the government wants, says, let's, let's push through this bill, regardless of the implications on citizens, regardless of the implications on their own uh, constituents who voted for them, they all just told the line and nobody questions anything. Right. And that for me is, is this is not democracy we are practicing. <laughs> okay, thank you for your reflections. Let's get into other newspapers now. Um, Niles Apon. Yes, so I have the Daily Guide. And um, the first one I see here is I will establish Tomato Factory at Akomadan, uh, says Alajibaumia. 
And um, EC presents certified voters registered to parties. And um, we have no constitutional crisis, says Bagwin. Mm. Trump sweeps US elections. And I, I have interest in, uh, I will establish tomato factory at Akumadan and the EC presenting certified voters register. Um, I don't know if you want me to read a few paragraphs. But then for the sake I of could time, yes I could just go. Would, would I mean, as for the establishment of tomato factory, mm -hmm. I remember when Alan Tremantin was minister for trade and industry, we established uh, a tomato factory in Brekum, and that is a blockchain tomato factory, and uh, through the one district one factory, and this whole project I think started in 2018, there about 2019, um, by the Wadi Africa Tomato Factory. I mean, this, this actually is no news. What should be news is that the ones that are established already should be made to work properly for Ghanaians. Because if Wadi Tomato Factory, it's, 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 about a, it's quite big enough to be able to produce um, uh, tomato paste and, and any other tomato-related product that we need. Um, I'm not making an advert for them, but this is a factory that does not need to import anything, any raw material from China whatsoever. Everything they need to, to be able to make this factory work is right here in Ghana. Right. And it was, it was spearheaded by Alan Tremontin. Okay. Now the EC have, presents... Okay, you have to make this very brief. Yes. I was, I was at the program yesterday. Okay. What time did you leave? We left... I left about 11 p.m., 11.30 yeah. p.m. And I stand you waited for about six hours. We, we sat, she, they made us sit for six hours, wasting productive man time. Now, what happened was this. They presented to candidates, reps, and political parties. Um, they had the external drives that contains the certified register. Mm -hmm. And issues were raised. The issue that was raised was that, okay, you are giving us this hard disk. Now, what we need is for you to break it down for us. Because you, this is in public. We do not want to go out there and have issues. So give us the breakdown. Give us the summary of what it and contains you didn't get here. That. Now, we didn't get that. Okay. Now, what they tell us mm -hmm. is that it is not legally mandatory for them to give to us. Then we told them, it's not legally mandatory. Who said that? The, the, the commissioners, or the commissioner, because she represents all of them. Jean Mensah yeah. himself? Yes. Okay. And the question is, the calling of the media, the public, and everybody to witness it, is it backed by law? If it is not, and it's an administrative process, giving to us what we have demanded is an administrative thing. The, Consultant who is in charge gave us a list, a content list, and he claimed that was a summary. I raised an objection to it. Okay. I said, I was there, I no, told no, him, I, I said, I this is a content we, we list. Have to move. We have this to is move. not a summary yeah. sheet you are giving us. Yes, hold for me, please. Remy, let's. Yeah, sweetie, get just, your... just before I get my, I mean, this is this, this really important. What happened yesterday yeah. was very unfortunate, and I just want to weigh in also on that. I, I, we need a media to, you, you also have to help because. We're going into an election. Uh, yes, you, you, after all the months of back and forth of accusations of uh, a tainted register, now you finally tell us that you have a clean register. I'm a parliamentary candidate. I don't have a presidential candidate, unfortunately. Nana has. We, we, I don't know, for example, I want to know that in, maybe in Domi Kwabinya, I have maybe, what, 10,000 registered voters? I, and because then if you don't give me the breakdown of the regional number, uh, how, many, how many, the overall number of votes in the country, the overall number of votes break down by region per constituency, mm -hmm. on what basis are you then going to uh, conduct this and then declare results? Yeah. You understand? And, and this is a very dangerous uh, precedent. So to have the parties wait for, it's more than six hours because the meeting was called for at eight, it's four o'clock. Four o'clock. And so four. after the back and forth and then you, for like six hours, when they didn't have the start, and then the parties demanded that they were not going to leave until they gave it to them. They said, okay, wait for us. We're going to work on it and bring it up. And Jamesha comes back around 11.41 to tell them that she's not mandated by, to, to do that. How can you come and do this? 
And, and, and it's, a very, it's very dangerous. And I mean, it's not, we should all not keep quiet. We need to really speak and ensure that we need this register because we have no evidence even that what you've given us, I have no idea whether what um, Movement for Change got is the same as what I got. So if they scrutinize their register and later come and say that uh, my register has 18 million, PPP says I have 14, NDC says something else, we have no standard figure from you to guide us. And it will be like we my, are just... My question then would be, moving forward, what do you yeah. expect from the EC? They just need to give us... You, see, you are telling us you've, this is a final race, it's clean, everything is done. So tell us how many votes, registered voters there are, and give us a breakdown. But, You're refusing to but, do but, it. But yet, Ben, just to, yeah. to ask you the same question. You sent... I saw your cameras there. I saw a reporter there. All right. Now, was your reporter able to tell you that the EC presented the certified voters register, and so today, as a stance in Ghana, we have five, two, three, four, ten million registered Ghanaian voters. Were your reporters able to tell you how many males, how many females are in that register? Were they able to tell you the, the original breakdowns? And today is the seventh. We're a month away from... We are not even... The Constitution is, says... Uh, the, the CI talks about 21 days or so to, to the yeah. elections. I don't know why the EC is rushing to give us what they are giving us. It is okay. I... The objections that were raised were legitimate. Yeah. Okay. Very legitimate. So uh, I was just asking, we have to go, but what do you want from the EC now on the back of these? Yes, we, the we, we need them to give us the statistics. I've showed the whole country that because he's also given it, done a press when I showed the country that you have finalized your race, you've given it to us. It is finished. But um, we don't have the details. Quick question. So does, need, all of need... this, does all of this pose a threat? to election 2024. It does, Benjamin. Like I said, how can we go into an election when political parties... That or is the, the fundamental no document we are working The true reflection of the register. Yeah, yeah. It poses a threat. It does. We ought to be able to know. And as you were saying, you've given me a disk, all right, a hard drive to go. You've given PPP a hard drive to go. You've given CPP a hard drive to go. We do not know the content. You did it in public. The whole Ghana was watching. Somebody sent me a video of Joy News showing it live. Now, everybody knows that Nana Ohininto and myself represented Alan Tremantin. We took it. We go and it's about maybe 14 million registered voters in there. We come, we raise a question, all right? Then you come to tell us, no, that was not what was okay, So CPP is, is saying the same, NDC is saying a different thing, NPP is saying a different thing. So information sharing happens? is still it is a problem. critical. All right. So we'll address opaque, that. Opaque process. I'm going to... Uh, are you done with your papers? No, let me just briefly... So uh, you can I just have, give us headlines. Sure. I have here the business analysts. Uh, IEA slams the Bank of Ghana over gold coin. Mm. Demands permanent solutions to CD instability. Um, inflation hits 22.1% in October. And then the power and energy Ghana export kicks off. And uh, a righteous report saying that cocoa farmers in Ghana hoard beans in anticipation of price hikes. Yeah. All right. I'll also leave you with my headlines. Uh, that's all time will allow us to do. The Ghanaian Times, you're undermining parliament. Bagbin accuses executive judicial arms of government. Uh, U.S. elections, Trump makes sweeping comeback as the U.S. vows to deepen relations with Ghana regardless of polls outcome. That was uh, Virginia Palmer, the American ambassador, who um, you know, spoke to the issue, saying that regardless of who won, they were still going to uh, deepen involvement with Ghana. Then there's our complete PTC interchange Takrade Market Circle project before I leave office. That's according to President Ekufuado. And um, he explained that the recent restructuring of Ghana's debts affected the two significant projects in the Western region, but assured that arrangements were on course for the resumption of works to ensure full completion. Then, next NDC government to construct bridge over River OT. That's according to Mahama. Uh, he said the construction of the over 500 meter bridge would uh, ease the daily transportation hustle of residents in and around the river. And uh, I think there's a final headline I wanted to look at. I don't know where that is. Let me see whether I can find it. Well, inflation, of course, inching up. But there was something else I, I saw that I wanted to bring in uh, very briefly. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Ah, yes, it's on the back page. I now remember. Ghana launches two sickle cell policies in Accra. And I feel this is, you know, 
those who suffer, or if you've been close to anyone who yeah. suffers from sickle cell disease, it can be, it can be ugly. The, the impact on organs and all of that. So this is something uh, laudable. That's it from my end. Um, we have to go, gentlemen. Any final thoughts? Yes. Um, brief, very brief. No, no, seconds. no. This, this is just something very brief. Alan is in the north. Mm. Alan is in the north. We've taken their campaign trail to northern region. And um, just as we did in Greater Accra, we're going to paint the entire of northern region yellow. And this is just to send a signal that it is not only in the Ashanti region or the Greater Accra region we are sweeping votes. We are sweeping votes in the north. And as the Dagumbes will say, you know, the Asiho, vote the Asiho, there you could say it in Dagmani. It says that they have the man. And I know a lot of Northerners are watching, a lot of Dagumba people are watching, my friends and so family. Dehengbenne. Dehengbenne. Oh, Charlie, I didn't know what kind of And so, right. so the Yellow Brigade is coming. They, yes, we are there already. We are there. The Yellow Brigade. Right. Okay. The Yellow Army. The Yellow Army. Really? Yes. Yeah, so to uh, to my campaign, yes. Don't don't be coming. I'm number four on the ballot, and um, the party, the campaign office is at Musuku Junction. We need volunteers. We need support to uh, encourage our people who want to see real change, real leadership. Mm -hmm in Parliament to swing by, offer their support. If you see anywhere my posters are, the phone number is on it, give us a call. Send us a moment to support the campaign, the, the young men who are helping, working house to house. And uh, we are very sure we'll deliver our mandate. All right. Thank you. Well, uh, congratulations. This is belated, but uh, congratulations to Dr. Godwin Setrofia Tupe, uh, Managing Director of the Cosmopolitan Health Insurance on earning your doctoral degree. Uh, your doctorate, your achievement inspires us all, and we at the Cosmopolitan Health Insurance are proud <laughs> and excited for future successes under your leadership. And it's from uh, the staff of the Cosmopolitan Health Insurance celebrating you, Dr. Godwin Setrofia, Tukbei Managing Director. So, congratulations to you, sir. Those who joined us for the conversation this morning, Nanay Sapon is political assistant to Alan Chermating. We also had Remy Edmondson, National Secretary of the PPP. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's time now for sports. Do stay. We'll be right back. Time now to bring you sports here yeah, on the AM show with me, Muftaw Nabila Abdullah. The University of Ghana sports director, uh, Dr. Austin Lubutera, says that politicians are pretending to be developing sports and that uh, they, they are not interested in the betterment of sports in the country. According to him, if they were interested in developing sport, they would have ensured that there's a policy that governs sports in the country. Our priorities are wrong. We want to copy, but we don't want to find out how they are making it. It's just like I see you, Mufta. Okay, you're, you are looking good, but I don't want to find out what came out before you got to this level of being good. I just want to get straight to your level. That's the, mind of, that's the mindset of Ghana. We want to see United States has done this. Yeah, we are quick. So United States, they are getting money in sports. Get, so let's get money in sports. You come. But what foundation did they build to get to that level? We don't even have a sports policy. It's something that has been worked on. I, I'm part of the, those who worked on it. Oh, okay, sure. Yes, I'm part of those. And then who. Dr. Bello, too. Yes. Yeah, and then um, yes. Dr. Enes Kranti. Yes, myself, Dr. Bello, Enes Kranti, and, and many others, uh, uh, the lawyer in uh, uh, what, the ministry. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we're part of I it. Was, I was one of the few privileged people who yes. were given a draft to read. Good. So you've done this. And it took us virtually almost a whole year to work on that. We finished working on it. Where is it? And I can tell you, because that's my area, policy, and I can tell you what will prevent many people not from doing that. It's reason that it's a way a lead out for them. Because policy is binding. Clear? Yeah. Manifestos are not binding. It's knee-jerk activities. Manifesto is, party, is binding to the party people. It's not binding to the country. So let's hammer on it. That's a place we can always hoover around. So they pretend, all of politicians, they pretend as if they are developing sports. No. They are not developing sports. You just say they pretend. That, I, that will say it, I'll say it clear because if you are not pretending, for years and years now you are operating on sports, you still don't have the policy. 
Are you not pretending? And it's not that you don't know that the other countries are having policies. Nigeria has a policy. They just they finished just, I guess, 2018 there about. All the countries we are trying to emulate, they are having their policy. In fact, you go to UK, they have their policy in different forms. The, yes, apart Africa. from the, the main policy, they have policy in sports business, policy in sports marketing, yeah. all the, they have policies. Yeah. Yeah. And we yet want to see Premier League going and we say, oh, we want to be like Manchester. You are sick. We want to be like uh, other countries. How did they get there? You've not laid the foundation no. to be there. You are not committed. And every year we are just thinking of manifesto policy, manifesto in sports. And journalists, you are part of it. You don't ask them on the main policy. You ask them to be a manifesto on policy and sports. Their manifesto is their party commitment. It's not nationally binding. Who can take you on? You take their manifesto, after all, there are several policies they came out with. People came out with, politicians came out with. And they can always find a way of swerving it. But once something binding, it's not for everybody. What is our youth development? Coast team is dead. Is it surviving? No. Move down. It's dead. Coast team is dead. How do we feed the, uh, the, the clubs? Knee jerking. How do the clubs feed to a national? We are waiting for somebody uh, who has worked his own way and gone outside the country. You only hear that he's out of the country. He's a Ghanaian. Oh, let's call him back. The person has built up a culture. Just like I mentioned about my lifestyle. Yeah. You d develop a particular culture. You move to a different culture. You are finding it difficult to adjust. It doesn't work like that. Now let's bring you the table of the UEFA Champions League after five marches into the competition. And this is how it looks like. Uh, currently we have Liverpool seated at the summit of it and they are followed by Sport and Lisbon. Monaco are third and there's Brest, Inter Milan, Barcelona, Borussia Dortmund and Aston Villa. We have Atalanta, Manchester City, Juventus, Arsenal, Bayer, Leverkusen, Lille, Celtic, uh, Dynamo, uh, Bayern Munich, Real Madrid, Benfica, AC Milan, Feyenoord, Club Bruges, Atletico, Madrid, and PSV. And then from 25 downwards, we have Paris Saint-Germain, Sparta Praha, Stuttgart, Shakhtar Donetsk, Girona, Salzburg, Bologna, RB Leipzig, Stamgrass, Young Boys, um, Savena, and then Brasti Lava. So this is how the table looks like, and if you are familiar with uh, the new format of the UEFA Champions League. It is the top uh, 20 teams and they will also go by the second losing side that moves them into the next phase of the UEFA Champions League. But currently this is how the table looks like after five matches into the competition. The UEFA Conference League later tonight and Chelsea, they will be reeling, reeling from the impact of the absence of one of their star players, Cole Palmer, who did not train yesterday ahead of their tie later tonight against FC Noah. Let's hear from the manager of Chelsea, Enzo Mariska. Cole is still, uh, he didn't train yesterday. So we see today if it's able to, to train with us. He's recovering from that. Uh, he had, uh, I would say, it knock in the session. Also, so we see for tomorrow for sure he's out and we see if he can be available for Sunday game. Otherwise, we'll be after an international break. All the rest, uh, as I said, unless uh, the one that they are not include involved in the squad, Conference League squad and the Jadon, the rest, they are all available. But we don't make change because of the big game, Sunday big game. Since we start, we make change because we have 24, 25 players, all fit, all good enough to play different competition. And this is the reason why we are making change and probably we, we're going to make change tomorrow too. Not, uh, it's not uh, a problem in terms of uh, the ones that they are playing in the Premier League. They also played some game in the Conference League or I don't know, the last one has been Mark Cucurella, that uh, he played Panathinaikos, Panathinaikos away and then he didn't play in the Premier League. But uh, I said many times, the ones that they are playing Premier League, that means that they are not going to play in the conference. And the ones that they are playing in the conference, that means that they are not going to play in the Premier League. The season is so long, we have so many games. 
and for sure all of them they are going to play conference league and premier league game or fa cup the next one so it's not uh, i already said uh, i can understand that from outside you can see uh, two teams but we have just uh, one team one squad 24 25 players all fit fortunately and uh, we're gonna try to use all of them and uh, i heard before the game uh, to be honest i didn't watch game uh, previously but uh, in the last two and uh, manchester united they were also being action in the europa league and their interim manager ruth van nistroy says that he feels the responsibility to do well for the club uh, in the game coming up tomorrow in, in Europe, uh, it's a European night at Old Trafford uh, against uh, the Greek champions, uh, second in the league current. So I, I have to honestly I have to say that I'm, I feel the responsibility to do well over over the over the next uh, week, uh, and that's my job. So uh, please, uh, yeah, don't don't uh, um, how do I say it? I'm focused on that and, and, and the others. I, as I said, I, uh, I welcome uh, Ruben. Um, happy here to help and help him. And, 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 and that's the, the situation for the moment. Um, well, different, uh, different cases, all of them. Um, Tyrell is, uh, is the furthest in the moment. He's part of team training uh, for a couple of weeks now, fully in, in team training, no restrictions. So he, um, yeah, it's, it's good for him to plan uh, then game minutes, maybe in, in, in the under 21s, we have to see. And the others are still, um, Harry's still inside, doing working on his rehab, and Luke also does pitch work like he did today. And he's progressing there to also, you know, do partial team trainings, hopefully soon. The point coming in this morning is that the Ghana Football Association prosecutor has charged George Akwesia Afri uh, with breach of section 112D and um, um, of the Ghana Football Association disciplinary code 2019 following a media interview that he had. It is alleged that, uh, that his commentary in the interview on the Ghana Premier League constitutes misconduct. That brings the name of the Ghana Premier League into disrepute. He has until Monday, November 11, 2024 to respond to the charges. So that is what is coming in from the camp of the Ghana Football Association. Uh, this prosecutor charges former vice president of the Ghana Football Association, Mr. George Afri. We have details on my job online soon. You're still watching the AM show on Joy News. Now, this next conversation is very important and interesting. I mean, for the first time, the world is coming together to celebrate World Burns Week. It's never been done before. This is the first time. And this week, actually, is World Burns Week. And Beyond Burns International, a Ghanaian um, non-profit organization that advocates for burn survivors, um, they've joined us in the studio this morning to let us know how they're also marking World uh, Burns Week. In the studio with me this morning is Judith Kato Addison. She's a founder of Beyond Burns International, a Burns survivor herself and an advocate. We also have David Amuzu, also a Burns survivor and a member of uh, Beyond Burns International. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank it you. is really good to have this conversation. I'm excited. <laughs> <laughs> right. So let's talk about Beyond Burns before we segue into the World Burns Week. What's I know you're a Ben survivor, but yeah. really, what inspired you to begin this journey beyond Ben's International? Um, let me say, somewhere in 2010, I started putting together a document, somewhere in 2008, actually. And by 2010, I had a document that said that at some point in my life, I would have an organization that would take care of um, Ben survivors and so also talk about the prevention of Ben's, mm. especially among children, since they make up the majority of Ben's we see in Ghana. And I tried, I tested the water at the time, and then it wasn't ripe <laughs> for us yeah. to start because then I couldn't start up like funding it. Yes. 
you know, it was a challenge. I was a student and I was using my money, you know, to buy a few things for survivors in the hospital and stuff like that. So come to this point in my life where I feel like there's no better time to start. If you want to do it, you better start doing it. And in July, we just Kick set started. a ruling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Before I go to David, I want to ask you, how challenging is it to be a band survivor and live and thrive like you're doing? I mean, I know you personally, so I know yeah. you're thriving, but how, how challenging is it? Um, I have seen different faces you know, to this, because it happened to me when I was 10 years old. 10? Yeah. You were 10? Yeah. So that. at that point, you know, and there was no psychological support. And the whole process made me more, you know, in, like internalizing a lot of the things that were happening to me at the time. I started just internalizing all of it and kind of advising myself from the beginning. So at some point, you know, your confidence is sh like shaken and you don't know how you are managing or navigating this life. And it was, it was difficult from the beginning oh. to start. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're here doing this now. Yeah. So we get to speak to David Amuzu as well. David, how has it been? You're a Ben survivor. You're out here advocating and marking International Ben's Week. What's your life like? Hmm. Well, life become miserable. Let's take it that way. Sometimes you step out. People watch, people, can, people watch you more than 10 times before you, you know, like someone passed by you, the person will be watching you as if you are not a human being. Mm. Yeah. So sometimes I have to leave home late, very early in the morning. Does it hurt? Can you put your hand? On yeah. It? Does it hurt? Seriously. So you're in pain as we speak? Very, I'm, I'm in pain. What happened to you? Uh, it was a car explosion. Your car exploded? Thank goodness. But well, you survived. Well, definitely, yeah. So does it make you uncomfortable when people are staring at you? Exactly, exactly. Sometimes I see people staring at me, I'm so disturbed as a human being. Because first, that's not how you are. And then people watch you more than three times before passing by you, you feel bad. You understand? Judith talked about psychological support. Do you yeah. think you have adequate psychological support? Definitely. Where do you get the support from? Family, friends? Tell us about that. Sometimes, you know, uh, let's say a friend, sometimes a friend, sometimes a family friend. You know, mm. you got to a point, you cannot even take a phone and call them again. Sometimes you call some people, definitely, it's difficult for them to pick a phone. Probably they, they may think you need something from them, right? So you got to a point, I said, let me hold myself. Well, thank you for sharing your story with us. So, Judith, how are we marking International Bands Week um, in Ghana? What are we doing? I know I've been seeing some um, um, interviews you've been doing so right. on social media and the rest, but what's the program here so far? Okay, so we started with webinars, which run through the whole week. Mm. So on the first, there was a speaker on the webinar talking about the current state of bands from yeah. a band survivor's perspective in Ghana, um, talking about what's the burden of bands on the survivor physical, nutritional, psychological, all of this. Yeah. So we, we kind of elaborated on that. The whole point is trying to advocate for equity when it comes to burn care, prevention, and survivorship. Mm. So the whole week we have the webinars going on. Mm. But on the Ghana, from the Ghana front, we are doing, we started school awareness mm. yesterday. We went to the police depot one and two, JHS and then primary. They have about 2,000 students. So try to go there a week before to sensitize them on burn, burn prevention in their houses. Yeah. And then, yes. So we did that yesterday. Tomorrow we have the Ben Symposium. Okay, and then where is we, it happening? It's happening at 297 Tessano. Okay. Yeah. Um, we, are, we are doing the um, Mr. Ampoma. He's with doctor, but he's been, you know, okay. elevated. So he's Mr. Ampoma. He's the keynote speaker for tomorrow. And we have nurses and then physiotherapists, psychologists, we all come together at 2927 to discuss what challenges survivors are going through. He's going to be there himself. And then after that, we'll have a fun time together. The whole point is to provide survivor support, really. So yes. for this, um, and your, the theme for International Burns Week is... Um, Burns Tackling the Hidden Global Health Crisis. Tackling the Hidden Global Crisis. Because indeed, it's a global crisis, but we don't talk about it much. Yeah. Before we go, before we wrap up, do you think that we are doing enough as a country in terms of our public institutions, um, government policies, and so on and so forth to support Burns survivors? 
uh, or to even talk about ben, um, prevention like you talk about? Um, it's, the task is really um, daunting because um, to start with, we do not have government legislation legislation mm -hmm. for the prevention of bans, mm -hmm. like a potent one that's really working. And if anybody wants to advocate for prevention, they, what happens in terms of funding? You know, you'd have to do it yourself. And if you cannot raise the money, people get discouraged along the line. Yeah. So there has to be something that we're intentionally doing, you know, trying to stop this because it's happening a lot to children. It happened to, happened to me as a child and a lot of children are getting hot water burns, which are easily preventable. Right. But because we are not focusing on the little things we can do in terms of education for mothers, even from the um, prenatal yeah. to postnatal, to let them know that now you have a child, one thing that's happening to children is that they're getting hot water burns. So as you go home, when you make your hot water, make sure you have cold water, mix it immediately, just in case your child you know, goes near it. Goes goes near it. Exactly. Especially when they start oh, crawling. You know? Yeah. Anyway, um, David, what will be your message to those watching us right now? Because we are, with this, yeah. creating awareness. We are also marking World Bands Week. What will be your message for those watching yeah, my, us? My message right? to those people outside that there's any time, they, they, you know, a fire, they never have a fire, they have to be careful of it. Probably cooking, they're cooking the food. Whatever those things, they have to be, you know, they have to be far away from the, 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 the fire, you know. And then at the probably that's what I can say for now. Thank you so much for sharing your story and coming. Juju, anything we want to put out there, call for support, anything you need um, so that we wrap up. Right. Um, if you want to support Beyond Benz International, the number to call is 0594108888. Zero five nine four one zero eight 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 zero. And tomorrow we um, on Saturday we have the Burns Awareness March. I'm inviting you to join us to talk about the prevention of burns on a wider scale. And then I think I'll speak for survivors when I say that um, burn survivors are just like you, and um, it can happen to you. Yeah. How you'd want to be treated in case you're a burn survivor, you should treat them as such. People do not like you to point fingers at them, make comments like they're not there because we can hear you when you make these comments. Judith Kato Addison, founder of Beyond Benz International, a Ben survivor herself and an advocate. And we have David Amuzu, a Ben survivor and a member of Beyond Benz International. Don't forget on Saturday they have, Friday you have the symposium. Right. Saturday there's the Benz March um, at 2927, please. You can find Beyond Benz International across all social media platforms for more information and support the cause. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you, CJ. And I wish you the very best. Thank you. And 2927 is in um, Tesano, so please. Just go onto your social media platforms and you find all the information there. Now, before we go, Ghana, get ready for the biggest giveaway from Syntex Tank. Syntex is giving away 15, Syntex is giving 15 communities free water. And this is simply to say thank you, Ghana, for making us number one. Syntex was the first to introduce double layer tanks in Ghana. Do you know that Syntex comes in so many different colors and sizes and was also the first to come out with inner white layer? So when it's not Syntex, forget about it. Now, if you're a community and you want to benefit from the Syntex free water giveaway, just log on to your social media handles at Syntex Ghana and nominate your community. The more you nominate, the better chances you have of Syntex visiting your community. Remember, it's Syntex, S-I-N-T-E-X, Syntex Tank. Not be any tank be tank, or the correct tank be Syntex Tank. Syntex a strong, a tough. We take a break. We'll return with more on the AM show. Don't forget that there's that interview um, AM exclusive with Benjamin Akaku. Please stay with us. This is the AM Show. Welcome back. We head into our big stories. And Speaker Alban Sumana Kingsford Bagbing has taken on the executive and the judiciary, accusing them of colluding to undermine the legislature, insisting no one would be allowed to destroy the institution. And yet, there's another stalemate expected as the NDC seeks to maintain its hold on the majority position in the House as Parliament returns today. What does this bode for the governance of our country for the governance of the state. Well, joining me for a conversation from the Parliamentary Network Africa, we have Sami Obi. Sami, good morning. 
Good morning, Ben. It's, it's good to have you join the conversation. I think since that last event uh, organized by the West Africa uh, Civil Society Institute, we've, we've not met. I hope you're well. No, we haven't. No, we haven't. No, I haven't. hope you're well. Very well. Thanks for asking. Okay. Uh, you'd have to speak up. You're drifting off a bit. I'd like to find out from you, first off, this entire, before we even get to what the speaker said uh, yesterday, these developments over time, the executive, uh, the legislative arm, and now the judiciary involved, what is your appreciation of these matters so far, how they have happened? Well, it's been brewing all this while, and I think that we did not take it as seriously as we should have right from the very beginning. Mm. Uh, remember that the executive, legislature, judiciary relationship has not been the best in this uh, last four years. Uh, right from uh, some of the rulings that came out from the Supreme Court related to who can vote, uh, if, if presiding in the House, to striking out portions of the standing orders of, of the Parliament of Ghana, right. to issues around budget allocation from the executive to Parliament and the judiciary and what have you. These matters have been simmering uh, for a while. And I think that uh, we could have been better off if the leaders of the three arms, you know, had taken more proactive steps at uh, addressing these issues and trying to have a meeting of the mind uh, much earlier. In some of the instances, they did. You recall that the judiciary and, and, and legislature have had to meet around how to execute issues around arrest and serving of court processes to members of parliament. And now the, the CDA has come out with uh, a notice in that regard. Uh, there have been times when the speaker has had to meet the president to discuss some important national matters where there seems to have been disagreements between the two arms and what have you. It is not unusual to have, you know, the arms of government being uh, at each other's uh, throats, so to speak, on matters that they disagree on. Uh, this is meant to happen in any democracy, especially when all three arms are seeking to assess their place and authority and to distinguish themselves as co-equal branches of government and not subservient to another arm. These things are meant to happen. However, the process through which we deal with them when they happen will be the true test of our democratic resilience. And I think that the arms may not have done too good a work in that regard. If you follow what, and I know you did, what the Speaker of Parliament said yesterday, one of the points he made forcefully was that he was not doing this for himself, but he was doing it to protect the institution of Parliament. What do you make of what the Speaker said yesterday? On that score, yes. And look, every Speaker, in fact, every parliamentarian, parliamentary staff, uh, leader in Parliament, and even those of us civil society organizations that do out and out parliamentary work would do whatever it takes to protect the test of parliament or the legislative arm in such a way that it does not get encroached into, uh, in such a way that uh, the executive does not see themselves as uh, a, a dominant and parliament being subservient and what have you. And so the speaker speaking coming very hard at that is not surprising, especially for a speaker who has perhaps spent his entire adult life in this arm, um, you know, of, of government predominantly. And that is why for us, some of us found it very surprising that in the past, some members of the legislature themselves have done things to undermine the legislative authority and, and the legislature in general mm. when they belong to that arm of government and must be seen to be you know, defending the arm of government, protecting itself, and making sure that it accepts its proper and true place in the democratic governance architecture that we've got in our country. So it wasn't a surprise at all that the speaker went on and on about that. Every speaker will do the same, by the way. He suggests some collusion between the executive and the judiciary. 
Is that assertion on the back of what you've seen, especially over these last four years? Is it justified? To come from the speaker, the leader of um, one of the three arms, alleging collusion, uh, joint collusion, you know, against his arm, so to speak, by the two others, was for me quite strong. You know, public perception can, 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 can pretend, so far as these matters are concerned. Of course, members of the public, uh, it's, not, it's no news that trust in the judiciary, and not the entire judiciary, but particularly the Supreme Court, has been waning for some time now uh, for many things that have happened. Uh, so there is public perception around that. There is public perception around what the speaker spoke about. But to have the speaker put more like a seal of endorsement uh, uh, on it, you know, was quite, uh, in my opinion, wild. Uh, perhaps the speaker could have drifted from that, in my opinion. Uh, just so you you say perhaps the speaker could have done what? Drifted from, you know, stating it in that particular manner. Just so that, because now it's almost like an endorsement of the public perception in town uh, by no mean person than the Speaker of the Parliament of the Republic of Ghana. And that's quite wild. It is quite wild, but if he realizes, and in his position, there's a lot that he will get to know that we probably wouldn't. If he thinks these two entities, these two arms, and by the way, when it comes to the separation of powers and, you know, to ensure that balance in the system, the administration of government, they are supposed to be co-equal, not subservient. You get it. So if he feels the, the rights, the privileges, the work of parliament is being impugned, should he, for the sake of peace, overlook it? Uh, which could lead to further erosion, or should he put his foot down? What do you think? Not overlook, but I think there could be other means in, in, in dealing with the matter, or other, other ways in dealing with the matter. Uh, remember that it, uh, the, the, in, in, our, in our Ghanaian tradition, and, and generally, I mean, if uh, the chief and his elders have issues, uh, you would not really generally expect that these would be issues that would be put out uh, non-proverbially in the public domain. Even if it is put into in the public domain, it will come close in some uh, uh, proverbial arrangement so that the, 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 the people involved will be able to understand it proverbially and deal with it in, in, in that context. Um, I, the speaker has the right to his own opinion. You know, and so nobody can take that away from him. I'm only saying that sometimes in stating our opinion or our uh, verdict on things, it, it, has, it may have far-reaching consequences. And for me, uh, as a Ghanaian, if I, and, and, and as an investor, uh, uh, for other people, for foreigners, for other Ghanaians, other investors, if the verdict from the Speaker of the National Parliament about the judiciary and the executive branch is one that shows or points to collusion, then I will be minded in investing in that particular country. I will be minded in how I get into uh, cases with the executive branch. I will be minded about all of those things. And that can be quite dangerous overall. He talks about I, this, I this, this supposed collusion meant to weaken parliament or the legislative arm do you feel within this fourth uh, you know the second fourth term uh, or the second four-year term of the MPP uh, has parliament been weakened in any way the interesting thing is that he of course is from NDC stock and so you can say that something it wasn't a, a free way for the ruling administration but do you feel some of these actions chip away at the, the sovereignty, so to speak, of the legislative arm, especially considering that he is saying that some of the, the actions of the executive are wrong, for which reason he's asked that the proper human sexual uh, rights, uh, values, and all of that, uh, the bill, be retransmitted to the executive. I mean, all of that is in there. Has Parliament been any weaker? Well, uh, Ben, remember that I work with Parliamentary Network Africa. I am 
I am a student of legislature and, 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 and the parliamentary institution. And so I have my, of the three arms of government, I have my biases that favor the legislative arm. In fact, I am of the school of thought that it is perhaps and by far the most important arm of the three. And so by the nature of my work and my own uh, 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 principles and, 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 and worldview of, of things, so far as the governance architecture and the arms of government is concerned, I am a proponent for the continuous strengthening of the legislative arm of government. So anything that seeks to affect the proper function, the abilities to do its work, the strength of the legislative arm of government is one that you have me uh, certainly speak again. For which reason, yes, I agree with Mr. Speaker when he says that uh, there's been acts that have sought to, you know, uh, weaken the legislative arm of government. And some of these acts may not necessarily even be the things that are within the public domain. We know how, you know, the executive branch tries to influence it to become uh, 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 leaders in the House who lead the committee because they probably are not in agreement with a particular committee chair and how he goes about his things. There are issues around budgetary allocation. And apart from the budgetary allocation, issues of uh, when the releases, disbursement gets done to Parliament in such a way that it stifles the work of Parliament in a way. There are issues around the very, very obnoxious decision by His Excellency the President and the executive branch to not accept the transmission of, the, of a bill that has been properly uh, 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 passed by Parliament and not going by what the said, so far as disagreeing with the parliamentary lawmaking decision is concerned, uh, these things certainly, and of course, how uh, even members of parliament themselves, depending on what side they fall, have either supported these things when they happen or gone against those things purely based on partisan political convenience rather than the goal of strengthening the institution of, of parliament. So there's been many unprecedented things that have been done during this last four years, which has chipped off the strength of parliament. And one would argue that, but these things are to be expected when you have a parliament that is led by somebody who is not a member of the executive branch. Well, in the future, we may have some of these instances, and that is the more reason why when these things happen, we must deal with them head on in such a way that we would not have the repercussions of these and, and unattended two issues coming back to haunt us in the future. Uh, now, if you look at this influence you speak of, even within Parliament, do you think it is so palpable because we have a system where predominantly members of Parliament are also members of the executive? You know what I mean. Ministers, yes. a chunk of them picked from Parliament. Does that create the situation? Does it in any way impinge on the independence of Parliament? And, no, and should, we, should we be looking yes, to change that? It does. And of course, I, I again belong to the school of thought and, and we've espoused this uh, severally, even as Parliamentary Network Africa. That, that constitutional provision that requires 50% and more of, of ministers coming from Parliament is completely useless now. Uh, it has outlived its usefulness. Uh, the reasoning behind it from the third Republican experience that informed that is, is, not, is untenable now, and it is one of those things that necessarily must be kicked out of our Constitution at the next available opportunity, because it does not produce for us legislators who are thinking about the legislative branch as the place of focus. It rather produces a group of people who are using the legislative arm as a springboard towards catapulting them into the executive arm. And mm. we've seen how people who have focused on the legislative arm through and through have really performed. And there is evidence in Ghana, we can name quite a number of uh, 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 legislators who are your legislators, legislators you know, because they focused on the executive, on the legislative branch and did not uh, uh, 
seek to find favor or, or, or place in the executive branch, for which reason they perform creditably and their name will forever be etched in gold, so far as our Ghanaian parliamentary arrangement is concerned. Mm. Uh, 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 you, can, you can speak about uh, uh, as the MP, Montaka Mubarak, after he left the executive part of the uh, legislature almost two times. You can talk about the, the likes of uh, uh, Dr. Kluch al You can talk about even the likes of Kweku Fasting after he left the executive and focused exclusively on the legislative branch. And how that exclusive focus, you know, brings out the power and ability to be able to serve the people of Ghana well through that equally important arm of government, the legislative arm. So yes, that provision in our constitution is completely, completely a major contributor to what we are seeing uh, in the system that makes the executive branch look like the senior brother among the three arms, when it is supposed to be one of the triplets. Mm. Now, just to conclude the conversation, two quick questions. One, uh, Parliament reconvenes today. What are your expectations? And two, based on what the Speaker has now said, so we see the trajectory as far as the executive, we see the trajectory as far as the judiciary. Now, the legislature is also digging its feet in. Uh, where do we go from here? So first question, Parliament reconvenes today. What are your expectations? Secondly, with the posturing of the three arms of government, where do we go from here? So the man who is supposed to hold the balance uh, in Parliament, the Speaker himself, when asked this question, this is your first question yesterday, he says he did not know what to expect today. And, and I, 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 I truly uh, uh, fall within that same space. It's, it's quite uh, murky. Remember that some of us endorsed the decision of Mr. Speaker to adjourn the House Senate with the intent to allow for cool heads to prevail, allow for reaching out across the aisle, conversations among the two sides of the, of the, of the aisle in Parliament, including getting um, important stakeholders you know, involved in the conversation to bring this to an amicable solution. So that when the House is reconvened, naturally, uh, all of these things will not, be, will not be met. Unfortunately, from the comments of the Speaker and from what we have seen and heard, uh, knowing what I know within the spaces that I work in, not much has happened. All that has happened is triggering a constitutional provision that allows for a recall. For which reason, we are not too sure whether the circumstances that led to the adjournment the disturbances of that particular morning about two weeks ago will not prevail again when we have the house coming back. Right. And it will be most unfortunate if it's so that it will show a group of leaders who only think party first and do not think about us and the things that must happen in parliament. And that will be one of the low lows of this parliament if we allow it to happen. Of the three arms of government, your second question is, uh, to answer that briefly, I think that now it is very clear that all the three arms have very critical and important roles to play in the umpires that has engulfed us at the moment. The Supreme Court, as the apex court of the land uh, and the leading court within the judicial arm, has a responsibility to adjudicate the matter that is before it and adjudicate it in a manner that makes for free, uh, makes for fairness makes for collective appreciation of the fact that these are rulings that will stand the test of time and will take away that perception of bias, you know, uh, 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 in, 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 its, in its way of doing things. And I trust that the Supreme Court can be able to do that. Yes, the ruling may eventually favor uh, one school of thought. But for me, if that school of thought that gets favored by the ruling is the ultimate school of thought that must prevail, then so be it. Ghana will be better for it. The executive branch has two more months from now, today being the 7th of November, to finish mm. with its four-year tenure. And they have every responsibility to ensure that they are holding the country together, uh, reaching out to Parliament proactively, doing the right thing to ensure that uh, the, uh, government business in Parliament does not get stalled, you know, and, and so they have that responsibility. 
And if that means that His Excellency the President must come down from his uh, throne, so to speak, and reach out to the legislator proactively, he must, because it would be his government that would be worse for it if things does not go well. Of course, the legislature, the least said about it, the better, because I have espoused what their own role will be. They must show us in today's gathering and subsequent history that they are truly the house of representation. Representation of who? The people and not the political parties that elected them into parliament. Uh, Sami, before you go, and we'll be crossing over to Parliament shortly, our parliamentary correspondent, Kwekwa Asante, uh, will, will be giving us, you know, the state of affairs there. These are actually what you're seeing on your screen now. Uh, these are live visuals from Parliament today. But before we go there, just, just, just finally, you mentioned that reaching out across the aisle is a better way. Some people have said that if it were Oseite Mentabuntu at the helm of the MPP in Parliament, he had a way of, you know, tactfully dealing with these matters. Uh, do you feel Afenyo Markin could learn more of that, or do you feel he could have managed the situation better? Short answer, yes. Short answer, yes. What's the long answer? <laughs> ben, I think the long answer is embedded in your question. You know, uh, you know it is not for nothing that we keep advocating for experience in, in parliamentary leadership uh, because it gets to a point where you have to go into your rapporteur of, 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 of uh, experience and events of the past right. to be able to pick out you know, that magic one that worked when you uh, uh, met the, the uh, J.H. Owusu'e champions and the J.H. and the, 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 the barbarians of our times and how they dealt with the experience really matter. It doesn't mean that inexperienced people should not get the opportunity to also learn the ropes and have it to do that. Okay. But uh, uh, you can do that also by, by recognizing that Parliament is the house of records. A lot of the things that happen in Parliament may have probably happened in the past. The right. records have shown how they were dealt with in the past, which made them better or worse, and then also going about dealing with them in that same manner. And I think Jay himself, uh, in his recent uh, interview with Evans on your, on your channel, acknowledged that you know, he would have dealt with the matter differently if he was the leader of the House. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel Bing, for joining the conversation, for enriching our conversation this morning. Samuel Bing is Executive okay. Director of the Parliamentary Network Africa. Thank you so much, sir. Well, I now connect to our parliamentary correspondent, Kweku Asanti. Those are live visuals from Parliament. Kweku, if you can hear me... When exactly is Parliament set to start its business today? And what can you report from uh, there today? Can you, can you hear me, Kweku Asante? You can see about 40 NDC MPs, or close to that number, have already taken their seat. And true to their word, they are taking the seats on the majority side of parliament. And so the pews you see, um, that side is the right-hand side of the right honorable speaker. And that is where the NDC MPs have taken. They say that they are the majority. You see there, their leader himself, Dr. Kasia Latofos, and the chief whip, Kwame Govan Sabuja. You see Zaneto Ajiman Rollis, you see Sam George, you see a number of their colleagues who have already taken their seats, um, waiting for more of their colleagues to join. Unlike the last time where this boo-ha-ha -ha happened in Parliament, there is not a single NPP MP inside this morning. We do not have any inkling as to what their strategy is or whether or not they are coming at all for today's sitting. And if they do come, would they take the minority side of the chamber or they will perhaps draw the Speaker's attention to the arrangement that have happened and insist that they be taken back to the majority side. Yesterday, we did hear from the the Speaker of Parliament himself, who insisted that when it comes to arrangement in terms of how the MP sits in Parliament, that is not his job. And he has absolutely um, no inkling, no idea as to how that will be done. And so he is not ready to go into those matters. And so the Speaker of Parliament has already given notice from yesterday 
that when it comes to where people sit, whether they are the minority, they are the majority, the sides of the house, it is not something that he will be concerning himself in that no holds barred press conference that he addressed yesterday in um, Parliament. Uh, to respond to a number of the issues that have happened right from when the Supreme Court stayed his decision on those four MPs. So that is the development when it comes to that. The other option that is available to the NPP MPs is to come and take the minority side. The House insists they are also the majority, but sit on the minority side and still get government business transacted because, as it were, some would say that is the most important thing. And you see it there totally empty, the minority side, only a few staff trying to make sure that the microphones are, are in check for the sitting to comments in the next two hours. And so the pews have been empty. The last time Parliament sat, not a single M M MP from both sides took the side of the minority benches. It has become like a pariah in Parliament because no one is willing to take their seat there. The majority side has become the, 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 the hot cake in Parliament with both sides going in there to try and get to sit. So like I was telling you earlier, not a single ND, NPP MP, I should say, has come here. The last time they were here as early as 5 a.m., led by the chief whip, a number of them, they did go inside, they took the majority side, there were, there were accusations that they had sidestepped the authority of the, of, the, of the clerk to parliament who had issued a secular, that the house was only going to, to, to open its doors at 8 o'clock a.m. Later on, when the military came in to do the sweeping, they did get out, and then ultimately, when they all entered, they entered from the 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 the, the majority side. All of them took that side until the NDC MPs overwhelmed them, and they actually eventually boycotted proceedings and left. And so, we do not have an idea what exactly the strategy is for them today, and if they will come at all. They they, they are the ones who requested this emergency sitting of the house, and so all the key government business that have to be done, they have to come here and lead it. And remember. The last time the Speaker of Parliament adjourned the House indefinitely, he did say that he had done so because the House did not have a quorum. The House did not have a quorum because if all NDC MPs were present, they were only 136. Or even if you added the one MP who seat was declared vacant, that is 137. That is not enough to form the correct number to take decisions in the House. And so he adjourned Parliament indefinitely. And pursuant to that, the NPP MPs triggered the constitutional provisions that allow them to recall parliament and that is why we are here two weeks ago they did request that the speaker of parliament has acquiesced and has recalled parliament to reconvene today and they are not here so that will be interesting whether or not the npp mps who requested this sitting will show up today or not that is something that we'll see in the next few hours especially because they have to come in here and prosecute business. And if the president, that is Speaker of Parliament, late the last time is anything to go by, with just any CMPs on the floor, he will not allow business to go on because that is not the correct number. So any CMPs who are already in the, in the, in the chamber having a conversation, you see there the uh, MP for, MP for um, uh, Wenchi and uh, his colleagues, MP from Navrongo, and there's also... Abednego Bandim, they are all having conversations among each other. Tete a tete. A lot of talks ongoing. The leader himself trying to have a conversation with some of the MPs who have already reported and are in the chamber to sort of discuss their strategies. We do not have an idea if they did have a, a caucus meeting prior to this. The last time there were some chats that was circulated on social media purported to be the, the, the messages on the NDC WhatsApp platform, the MPs. And they came out to deny at the time. They said that those were not messages from their platform. And so the, you see the Imano Amako Fibua and a number of them who have all arrived. The numbers keep coming in and a number of them keep walking in one by one, one by one, and sending the number a bit high. So Benjamin, that is the situation here in Parliament. About 40 NDC MPs have arrived. They've taken their seats. They are taking the majority side. They insist they are the majority in Parliament. No NPP MP is currently in sight. And we, we, we expect that they will come in pretty shortly. You, 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 I've just seen MP, NDC MP for Medina, Francis Xavier Susu, who's also walked in. So in the next one or two hours, we will get to see what the situation will be. Will the NPP MPs turn up and show up and come and do government business because they requested this? Or they will not because they do not want to take the minority side of the house. This is all the issues we'll, we'll, we'll get to know in the next few hours.
when the Speaker of Parliament himself takes his seat and gavel the House in session. Benjamin. Santi bringing us live scenes from uh, Parliament and letting us know what exactly uh, is happening there. As you can see, one more time, uh, members of the NDC caucus have taken the majority side in Parliament, over 40 of them. They are seated. There's no sight of any of the ruling administration's members of Parliament. And uh, if that is anything to go by, the Speaker could, on precedent, like Rikwasante mentioned, uh, you know, not allow government business to continue because the quorum has not been formed. And members of uh, the ruling administration in Parliament are not on the floor. But that's our reportage from Parliament for you uh, this morning. That's our discussion. As things develop, we'll bring you the status of uh, that. We're taking a break. When we return, we have more conversations coming your way. In fact, when we return, it's AM exclusive, and it's that exclusive conversation on the back of the birthday of King Charles III, the British monarch. Today, it's an engagement between yours truly and Harriet Thompson, who is the British High Commissioner to Ghana. That, after the break. Benjamin Akako, it's another installment of AM Exclusive. It's always glad going to different places to bring you these exclusive conversations. And today I'm glad to be here. Where am I? It's the residence of the UK High Commissioner. This is a place where they've all been, huh? John Benjamin and all of them. But today I'm sitting here with the current UK High Commissioner, Harriet Thompson. Interestingly, my first conversation with her, so I'm going to make the most of it. But for you, welcome aboard. Welcome. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you finally. Ah, pleasure to be here. So I'm saying welcome to them, but you're welcoming me, right? Uh, I am first time when you're you. Um, so let's, let's kick it off with what your experience has been like so far over these last few years serving in Ghana. I want to know everything. Yeah. Food you like, food oh, you gosh. don't like and everything in between. Mm -hmm. what's, what's the ambassadorial situation? Interesting that you started with food. We could go down that track and literally be speaking for, that, for the full hour. Uh, so let me limit myself. So, I mean, you won't be surprised to hear the whole family loves Kelly Red, red and Kelly Welly is a staple. Oh. Uh, I think that I am doing well because when I first arrived in Ghana, I would very frequently get the words autumn for and omoto muddled up and now I can say them correctly <laughs> in the right place so uh, omoto and granite soup is another favorite we could go on with foods but yeah it's been a real privilege doing the job as well the relationship between Ghana and the UK yes it's it's deep it's historic but it's also very modern it's very broad it's very forward focused and the number of times I will come back from an engagement, a conversation with somebody and think, my gosh, it's a real privilege to do this role. Mm. And in terms of people often talk about Ghanaian hospitality, it's not all rosy, so I don't expect you to feign it. But what has the reception been like from governments and, and when you're on the street, you know, walking, ordinary Joes and Janes meet you? What's the experience like? So, I mean, walking around, it's always fascinating uh, to see the things that are unique to Ghana, the things obviously that are different from the UK, and becoming familiar with that is one of the privileges of the role. Um, I find that people don't bat an eyelid on the whole, apart from actually at the airport, I can tend to get recognised and then I'm always surprised that people know who the British High Commissioner is. Um, mm. So that's been really interesting. And from government, from civil society, from leaders in various walks of life, I've been really touched by the openness, the willingness to have, the desire to have a relationship, mm -hmm. again, is something that makes this job really special. One of the things you've been doing here in Ghana is to highlight, you know, the work of the UK in Ghana, what collaborations exist. Uh, but another major thing is to talk about the King's Birthday Party, which is happening on the 14th of November. But for us in Ghana, for the commission and friends of the commission, it's taking place today, the 7th of, of November. Tell us a bit about 
the birthday party and why it's so relevant you know, mm. to the UK and its relations with other members of the Commonwealth. Sure. So the King's birthday party, obviously, we're celebrating our King. But because we're celebrating here in Ghana, it's an opportunity to, for us to celebrate the UK-Ghana relationship. It's a really special relationship. The people connections, there are 110,000 Ghanaians living in the UK, far more than that when you count also people with Ghanaian heritage. There are many people with dual nationality, both living in Ghana and living in the UK, people that travel for work, people that travel for study, for business, for leisure. So the people connections are strong. Everybody in Ghana seems to have an opinion or mm -hmm. a connection with the UK. Um, and we're aligned on so many issues as well. When it comes to the focus on economic growth, for example, it's a top priority for both of our governments. When it comes to recognition of the importance of tackling climate change, our governments agree. When it comes to international issues, for example, Russia's invasion of Ukraine or the need to reform the international financial architecture, our governments are aligned. So on very many issues, there's huge scope for collaboration between the UK and Ghana. And it's not just government to government, it's institution to institution, it's individual to individual, it's private company to private company. So a very special set of issues for us to celebrate and collaborate on. How, how is this going to enhance our relationship, UK-Ghana relationships, or partnership, I should put it that way? So the King's Birthday Party is an opportunity for us to strengthen our relationships with our partners. There's an opportunity for us to thank our partners mm -hmm. for the collaboration that we've enjoyed to date. And we'll be celebrating particularly this year youth as the theme for our King's Birthday Party. Mm -hmm. It's a theme that the King has long championed, empowering youth, not just in the UK but around the world, including here in Ghana through the King's Trust, which used to be known as the Prince's Trust, the King's Trust International. Uh, and it's a theme that he will be championing in his role as head of the Commonwealth as well. So you'll see at the King's Birthday Party young chefs, for example, who've collaborated oh, with the resident chefs to create a unique UK Ghana fusion menu. We'll have a fashion show by uh, Ghanaian fashion designers who are promoting sustainable fashion. Uh, we've got young musicians performing, we've got young dancers performing. So we're really trying to celebrate everything that's good about Ghanaian youth. Well, that's interesting. I do know the King, uh, King Charles III, has an affinity for the youth, which is a good thing. If you look at Africa's burgeoning population by 2050, the percentage, even now, the percentage of youth in there. But, but the question is, why? Why the youth? Why this affinity for the youth? And how does it reflect as far as the celebration is concerned? So the King's focus on the youth is really, it's all about empowering young people. He recognised long ago that there are young people who are being left behind, who are missing out on life's chances and opportunities. Mm. And that's what prompted him to set up the Prince's Trust International, Prince's Trust in the UK, Prince's Trust International, international around the world, mm. including here in Ghana. When you look at the picture in Ghana, we know how young Ghana's population is. When you look at the picture in the Commonwealth as a whole, over 60% of the Commonwealth, people living in Commonwealth countries, are below the age of 30. That creates huge opportunity, but in order to realise that opportunity, we may need to make really deliberate strides to make sure that young people really are getting those opportunities. So, for example, here in Ghana, um, we have been working for a long time with the education ministry uh, mm -hmm. to support reform of Ghana's education system, the, cu the curriculum, including the focus on TVET. Um, through British Council, we are working with Government of Ghana well, and with Ghanaian universities, Ghanaian institutions, to make sure that the curriculum they're teaching is what the private sector, what the employers need. It's really important that people are coming out of Ghana's universities not just uh, able to take on uh, employment, for example, in the public sector, but able to create the jobs that Ghana needs uh, that are going to grow the economy and really harness the impact that Ghana's young population can bring to the country. Well, that's interesting. And we've been talking about this proposed new curriculum or curricula for senior high schools, for example. Uh, was the UK a, a partner as far as those ideas were concerned? I mean, we're talking robotics, we're talking more languages being added to the skill sets of these people, whether they're in the sciences or general arts or business. 
uh, etc. Is that an area of interest? Is that something you contributed to in any way? So we do. I mean, we have a long-standing and ongoing partnership with the Ministry of Education, uh, and we talk with them. I mean, on an ongoing basis about changes that they're making in the system, and we try to support those changes. So, for example, setting up the TVET unit. Um, and the complementary curriculum unit uh, mm. uh, as part of Ghana's education system. Those are things that we've supported. But every country needs to constantly check what it's teaching its children and make sure that we're equipping them for jobs that we can't imagine. When people who are starting school today finish high school or even finish university or whatever tertiary education they do, some of them will be moving into jobs that do not exist today. And we need to expand their minds. We need to get them ready for those new worlds. So teaching them, teaching them to learn and continue to learn is, a, I think, a challenge for education systems around the world. And I'm really yeah. pleased with the partnership that we have with Ministry of Education here in Ghana. Right. Now that we're talking education, I'm taking a little bit of a detour. I, I realize that sometime from last year into this year, there was talk, I believe, under Rishi Sunak, uh, you know, some changes that purportedly were going to happen so that students in the UK from Ghana and other countries wouldn't necessarily be able to bring you know, other parties, relatives, wives, and all of that. I have friends in the UK, Ghanaians, who called and said, ah, this is what is happening now. But even apart from that, there have also been situations where Ghanaian students in the UK have been stranded, students who are on scholarship, and yet when the payments don't come, then it becomes you know, a crisis. And I think in recent times, some of them had their visas revoked. Um, once the school no longer, you become persona non grata, so to speak, mm. then things follow through. How can such people be helped better to ensure that they don't get stranded? I'm not mm. blaming your your government for this, but mm. how can they be helped so that the experience is better? So the advice I give usually when people ask me about anything to do with visas is to go to the website, gov.uk website, to check the rules and then to stick to the rules. Mm. Uh, it's, it holds true when you're making a visa application. Um, we receive thousands, you can imagine thousands. I think we granted 67,000 visas last year. Mm. We grant seven out of 10 applications. Seven out of There's 10. There's an 85% uh, satisfaction rate with the service that people receive. Mm. But things tend to go wrong when people don't follow the instructions on the website. So maybe uh, the money is meant to be in your bank account 28 days before your application, and it's only been in for 10 days before the application. Just follow the process. And the same when you're in the country, uh, you know what the rules are that apply to your visa. Make sure you stick to those rules. On the immigration, uh, the uh, rules... Unfortunately, though, my, my, my apologies, these students on scholarship, and I'm, I'm speaking specifically about them because then you know that your government is going to be paying. I mean, the Ghanaian government is going to be footing the bills or there's an establishment in Ghana, the scholarship secretariat or wherever, supposed to pay your, your tuition fees, among others. If these don't come through, you can't, you can't really put the blame on the student, can you? I mean, no, I mean, it's not to blame the student. In mm. situations like that, uh, it's not the student's fault, but the, the, the rules, the immigration rules still apply, and the student then needs to follow the immigration rules. Yeah. But I did want to pick up on the other comment that you made about um, partners and families accompanying students. Uh, research students, PhD students, they are still able to have their families with them, okay. their partners with them. Um, we had a changeover in government in July and our current government is reviewing all of the package of rules that go around uh, our immigration process, whether it's for students or whoever else is coming to the UK. Um, our government in the UK is absolutely focused on economic growth and the value that people coming from outside of the UK can bring to the British economy is very well recognised. And so making sure that we are able to take advantage of people who want to come study in the UK, people who want to contribute to the UK's economy uh, through their endeavours after their study is something that we need to make sure we do within the bounds of the immigration rules and system. Well. The Americans have now uh, voted, but let's stay on the trajectory of youth because a chunk of those going to vote in the Ghanaian election on December the 7th um, is youthful, or we're talking about young people. In respect of this conversation we're having, how is the UK interfacing with 
the government of Ghana, institutions like the Electoral Commission, among others, to ensure free, transparent, peaceful elections in Ghana. Yeah, so Ghana clearly holds its democracy very dear. That's a message that's come through loud and clear in the years that I've been here as I've traveled around the country. Ghana is proud of its democracy, its democratic tradition, the peaceful transfers of power that you've enjoyed. Uh, and the UK, like Ghana, really wants to see this coming election be another example of this. Um, democracy is not all about elections, so we work with organisations like civil society, like the Electoral Commission, uh, in advance of, in between elections, not just when it comes to sort of the six month lead up. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that we've been asking lots of questions of lots of people about how they see these elections going, about the preparations for the elections, about some of the issues that are being raised in the press around preparations. Um, and we, we take a balanced approach, of course. The UK has got no uh, position on who it wants to see victorious in these elections. But it is really important that it's a good, strong process. As you say, it needs to be credible, transparent, inclusive and peaceful, most importantly. Um, and if Ghana succeeds in delivering a process like that in the same way that it has done since the beginning of this republic, then um, we'll have another legitimate government in power and I'm sure the transition will be smooth and the UK government will remain committed to our relationship with Ghana, working with whomever. Uh, wins the elections on the 7th of December. How then is the UK, how specifically is the UK enhancing, adding on, uh, partnering Ghana, not just the government but mm. institutions like the Electoral Commission in terms of governance and ensuring that the elections are what we all hope they will be? Yeah. One of the most important things I think we're doing is working with organisations like CDD, the Centre for Democratic Development, CADEO, right. the Coalition of What's Democratic, Kadeo's done? Democratic election, election observers, observers. Um, to support their efforts. Mm. Uh, so we are funding 1,200 domestic election observers who will be part of Kadeo's. Yeah, part okay. of Kadeo's efforts, uh, significant efforts on election day to observe what's happening right the way across the country. We'll have our staff out as well alongside the diplomatic community. But international efforts have got to be about bolstering domestic efforts. These are Ghana's elections and how Ghana observes what's happening, how Ghana uh, polices the elections, how Ghana runs the elections. That's all for Ghana. So we're, we, we have been working with the Electoral Commission. Um, we have been working with Codeo and CDD. We talk regularly with the police and the security infrastructure, the military defence, with the parties. And with everybody that we talk to, what we're interested in is, I mean, primarily we're interested in what they're doing now in advance of the elections to help create an atmosphere that's conducive to peaceful, to good elections. Um, when I talk with people who aren't directly involved in the process, voters rather than people with a role to, with a role to play in running the process, I'm concerned by how many of those people see violence as an inevitability when it comes to elections. That's not to say widespread violence, it's not to say significant violence, but there is, there does seem to be, amongst a lot of the population, an expectation that there will be some violence. And that's a real worry. It's not part of Ghana's democratic tradition, mm -hmm. and it's not necessary. But the actions that people are taking now, the messages that people are giving now, whether deliberate or inadvertent or by mistake, all of that will help create an atmosphere that is conducive to peaceful elections and it's really important that everyone is taking full advantage to create that peaceful atmosphere from now. I see. And uh, when it comes to the elections, just a quick thought, I mean in the last elections there were some deaths recorded um, in the Techiman area among others. Everyone is trying so that such scenarios don't play themselves out. Uh, within this election, but that also in a way had to do with the involvement of the military. W what do you make of such a situation? I mean, so it's it's, we've used them to enhance, because of the numbers of security operatives on the ground, they have more or less become a part of you know, um, security for the elections. 
But some also say that it is, it is not the best of situations because the orientation of the military is very different from the orientation of the police, for mm. example. What, what is your quick thinking? My understanding that? is that the position is very clear. The police have primacy when it comes to policing the elections mm. and they will draw in other representatives from other civilian um, security the prisons, for example, uh, to increase their numbers. It's only when the police feel that they cannot uh, get a handle on a situation that they might then decide to call in the military. It's only on that, in, that request from the police that the military would go in. Um, and it's important that there is that fallback there because peace is the most important thing. Um, however, it's, it's also important that people feel protected and not intimidated by right. the security presence on election day. So the military being very much in the background, there if necessary but not visibly present until the point unless they are actually needed. Striking that balance between reassurance and uh, a sense of a sort of intimidation, I think is, it's a really difficult one. Um, but I'm, I know that the Electoral Commission for Security has been meeting regularly, and I know that it's something that's been on their minds from the conversations I've had with some of those members. Right. The UK, among other Western countries, including the US itself with its own drastic measures, has had a problem with the smuggling of drugs into, into the country. In recent times, there was you know, one such attempt, and that is another thorny area in terms of relations between the UK and Ghana. What does that look like for you and how, does, how do such actions impact Ghana-UK relations? It's an area where we highly, highly prize the relationship that we have with Ghana. Mm. The, the collaboration between the National Crime Agency of the UK and uh, IOKO, NACOC here in Ghana is incredibly important to us and it's seen some really significant successes even over the last three or four months we've had five million pounds worth of cocaine seized at uh, Kotoko airport um, people who are about to get on a BA flight yeah. to take that drugs take those drugs to the UK sell them on the streets with all of the harm that that does mm. uh, we've also had uh, just in the last couple of weeks uh, four people sentenced um, which are for drugs smuggling, which again has been the, the product of that collaboration between the British agencies and the Ghanaian agencies. So yes, it's an area that we need to continue to remain vigilant about, mm. uh, but it's an area where that cooperation between our law enforcement agencies is really paying off. Mm. And in terms of such security, because that it is UK security, it is Ghana security, it is intelligence sharing and all of that, but you also look at the threat from the Sahel. Unfortunately, we are surrounded by some countries who have fallen to coup d'etats, which also erodes, it chips away at the democratic credentials of, of the sub-region. But you also look at insurgency in some of these places, and you look at Boku, for example, and the turbulence there. What is the thinking of the UK High Commission on developments, especially recently? I'm sure you've seen images, videos, and all of that, and how how much more are you going to collaborate with the government of Ghana to bring some cessation to that? Mm. So we fully agree with the government of Ghana's uh, assessment of the situation in the region. The violence, particularly in Burkina Faso, has been escalating over the years even that I've been here. And we work closely with Ghana to uh, support their efforts to um, maintain the resilience factors, I suppose, that have protected Ghana up until this point. So the strength of Ghana's armed forces. We highly prize our relationship between the two militaries in, the, in our two countries. Uh, and we're working with Ghanaian armed forces, for example, to develop a special operations brigade uh, to boost their and other law enforcement agencies' readiness to deal with a terror attack should it occur, or indeed any other type of crisis. Um, so we're working with Ghana uh, to help ensure that they remain this peaceful, uh, peaceful country in a region that is beset by the problems that you just talk about. The situation in Boku is highly complicated and I don't want to get myself into hot water by trying to suggest what might be a way out of it. The, the problem's been going on for decades uh, and people who are 
far more uh, informed than I am have been trying for decades to try to realise a long-term solution for those set of issues. I do have a worry that uh, jihadists outside of Ghana might see some of the tensions within Ghana potentially as opportunities right. um, uh, and uh, use them to their own ends. So for that reason, amongst others, the violence and the death, the injuries that have already been caused, uh, I hope that we see an end to the violence, to the conflict, the disagreements in Boku as soon as possible. I wish the mediators good speed uh, and hope that they will, they will find that long-term solution. And I send some sincere condolences to everybody who's been affected already. Mm. Mm. Let's talk about the Commonwealth and um, the 56, some 56 nations involved, including the UK and and Ghana. Recently, there was some good news for us because the Secretary General, the incoming Secretary General, is our very own uh, Foreign Affairs Minister, Shirley Ayoko Butri. Uh, before we delve into other matters related to the Commonwealth, what, what is your reaction to that? I know you're all for women's empowerment and all that. What was your reaction? I am all for women's empowerment uh, and I, I wholeheartedly congratulate Minister Botre on her election to the post. Uh, she's done a super job to get there. She's, it's been a pleasure working with her in her current incarnation as Foreign Affairs Minister and I'm very much looking forward to working with her as Secretary General as well. How, I fully congratulate Ghana and Minister Botre on her appointment. And, and speaking of women's empowerment, I'll come back to the Commonwealth. For the first time, we have a female Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rachel Reeves. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that must have also got you excited. Very, yeah, very. I'm definitely not alone in mm -hmm. being very proud uh, to have watched the first female Chancellor in 800 years of that post stand up and deliver her first budget last week. Yeah. Wow, a I, really knew it was, I, I didn't know it was like eight centuries. Mm. Yeah. That, that must be a... A very thick glass ceiling that has fallen uh, but congratulations to her of course and we wish her the very best and we hope that there'll be many more of such first and that then those women in positions such as that will become less remarkable both in the UK and here in Ghana and around oh, yeah, the world. I mean you've had uh, female prime ministers and all of that too I guess it, it, it was about time mm -hmm. especially with Margaret Thatcher standing out as the Iron Lady but let's come back to the Commonwealth in respect of that call by um, Commonwealth leaders in recent times, especially from Africa, that there must be some reparation for the evils of imperialism, colonialism, and all that. I listened to PM Kirstama speak about it. Some African leaders did not like his rhetoric and all of that. What are your takeaways from the different positions, and what do you think is um, a viable way forward. Mm. So the, the slave trade was abhorrent. Mm. Uh, that is undeniable uh, and, and people are still living with the impacts of that today. Uh, the position of the British government is that rather than try to make tra cash transfers to uh, form reparations for what's happened in the past, instead we'll look at what the needs are now and work with countries on the most pressing issues today for example, around economic growth, around the need to tackle climate change and to, to deal with the impacts of those countries who are already suffering from the effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. It's the approach that I've taken here in Ghana as well. So I do celebrate the modern and forward-looking partnership that we have. Um, I also feel it's very important for me to learn from and be respectful of the past. So it was an absolute privilege, to use that word again, earlier this year to have been invited to Kamasi for the, the commemoration of the end of the, the Anglo-Ashanti War, mm. 150 years since the yeah. end of that war. It was a privilege again to have been present when uh, objects that were the looted artifacts. from Kamasi right. were returned uh, 150 years after they were taken thanks to the really strong connection, the partnership between Ghanaian institutions and British institutions. Mm. Um, in 2007, former Prime Minister Tony Blair was in Ghana when he expressed his deep regret um, for uh, slavery uh, and the impacts of slavery on the people who are affected both then and now. Um, and it's by looking forward and addressing the issues of today that the government, my government believes we can best address it.
Mm. And just to chip in, um, one thing I found curious about the return of the artifacts, it is temporary, but I guess those are conversations that can be had uh, for the future. But let's, let's look at the UK in terms of creating that pro-economic growth um, environment. It's, it's been touted in recent times. How will that play out, especially mm. considering Ghana-UK relations? Oftentimes you would have African countries say, we're not asking for handouts, we're asking for a level playing field mm. so that we can also rub shoulders with you, we can make something out of our exports and develop our own countries. What does this mean for the UK? Absolutely. So economic growth is, as I mentioned earlier, is the top priority of the new British government, the incoming British government. And we saw that in Rachel Reeves budget last week. Um, not long after coming into office, our government uh, hosted an investment summit that saw £63 billion of investments committed for the UK, which really demonstrates that confidence in the UK as a place to do business. Our economic relationship with Ghana is one of the most important pillars of our relationship. Bilateral trade currently stands at around £1.4 billion and the majority of that is exports from Ghana to the UK. We want to see that grow, we want to see it grow in both directions. There's a trade partnership agreement that should be supporting that growth in bilateral trade. People aren't making as much use of it yet as they could be. It provides for duty-free, quota-free export of everything apart from arms and ammunition from Ghana to the UK. And Ghanaians can import duty-free and quota-free many products, including machinery, uh, including uh, manufacturing equipment, chemicals, uh, metals, all these products that can help with the growth of that value-added part of the economy here in Ghana. So there's lots more that we can do with that. And uh, we have in common with the government of Ghana that commitment to building the private sector, to building the relationships between the private sectors in our two countries, and with that, seeing the jobs come through and seeing the economic growth come through in both of our countries. Do you, are you signalling then that Rachel Reeves' budget will, will mean anything different for um, Africa, so to speak, or let me be more specific, Ghana, in terms of how the dealings operate on, on the trade level. Is there going to be anything different? So our Foreign Secretary has made clear that he sees all of us as his officials, his uh, international network, he sees us as the international arm of that British government commitment to economic growth. Right. So everything that we do, he's asked us to take an economic growth lens to it. What that means for Ghana is, is it's building on very much what we have been doing already. As you said earlier in the conversation, Ghana wants, it doesn't want to be a recipient of aid, it wants to be a partner when it terms, comes to economic growth. So it's mu very much building on the, the sorts of relationships that we have with government of Ghana, helping to develop investor framework policies, for example, helping to create the conditions that investors want to see in order for them to be comfortable investing in, in projects here in the country. Um, the work that we do on health, on education here in Ghana, that's about creating a, a healthy, strong workforce that are going to be ready to take on that mantle and deliver that economic growth that's going to make Ghana even more of an important economic commercial partner for the UK in years to come. Mm. Let's segue back to climate change briefly because it's one of the key areas of collaboration between uh, the UK and the rest of the Commonwealth, especially those of us here in Africa because we're in the tropics, this place is pretty warm. We feel the effects of climate change, global warming more. What, what is being done? What can be done? And pardon me if I go back to the bit about reparations, not because it is reparations, so to speak, but because in the past, in the COPs, COP26, COP27 and all of that, there's been talk about countries like the UK, France, you know, supporting countries in Africa to deal better with climate change financially. What is the status of that and what is the plan moving forward? 
First up, I think what you say about the effects of climate change mm. in Ghana, in this region, is a really important point. For those people who are still saying that climate change doesn't exist, just look at the floods yeah. that we've seen in Ghana, look at the droughts that we've seen in Ghana, look at the impacts that it's having on cocoa growers, on oil palm growers, and then try and convince anybody that climate change isn't real. So we have supported with over a million pounds uh, efforts to um, help those farmers who've been affected by the droughts recently. We supported the efforts to support, uh, to help those Ghanaians who are affected by the floods uh, as well. But over the long term, for example, we are working with uh, cocoa farmers and oil palm farmers to help ensure they get better inputs to their businesses. So better better uh, stock, better chemicals, better advice, better financial services, and then to create a market for more sustainable forest products. We've also been working with the Ministry of Finance uh, and supporting the creation of a climate finance uh, division within the ministry because it's still proving too difficult for countries to access the climate finance that is available. Ghana has been calling for a long time for a reform of the international financial architecture, including to make it easier for countries to access international climate finance. And that's an area where we're very much aligned and are working together as well. Mm. And just to touch on visas uh, one more time, there are some new processes that have been uh, brought to bear as far as securing UK visas are concerned, e-visas among others. That's also been topical. I just want to take you back a little bit. What's the latest on that? What, what should Ghanaians know in respect of that? So from 2005, for people staying in the UK for a long period of time, they will need an e-visa rather than having the vignette in their passport. My best advice for them again is to go to the gov.uk web pages where there are really clear instructions for what people in that situation need to do. Okay, so it's as simple as that. It's as simple as that. And the reason for me saying go to the web page rather than me trying to tell you now is because I don't want to confuse everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the information on the website is very clear. It's very uh, straightforward instructions to follow. So that's by far the best thing for people to do. Mm. G going back to the, the visa granting rates, you mentioned about 7 out of 10, about 80% thereabouts. How consistent has this been, just out of curiosity? That's a question to which I don't know the answer, I'm afraid. Mm. Uh, I can tell you that for now it's 7 out of 10, around mm. 7 out of 10, so around 70%. And as I say, high rates of customer satisfaction. For student visas, it tends to be higher. Um, and universities, I was just hearing from a colleague this morning, actually, who was telling me how much universities and schools in the UK welcome their Ghanaian students because they tend to do really well. Um, so that is perhaps one of the reasons uh, that we're seeing those, those high acceptance rates, even higher acceptance rates for student visas. But so trends Ghanaians over time are known are not to be hard workers both in school and on the field. So mm -hmm. no surprises in there. And, and let's hope that keeps uh, up. But, but let's also talk about human rights issues. Um, there are some of them in Ghana. In, in recent times, you may have heard of some protests and people getting arrested and, and all of that. But then there are also the issues of LGBTQ and all the other surrounding matters. There's, there's a bill um, uh, the president should have signed. Uh, others say, well, he had his rights not to sign it, and it's still pending the court's decision, I mean the apex court. But on the front of human rights, what is the nexus? What collaborations exist? And how does the UK feel about human rights in Ghana especially vis-a-vis -vis the LGBTQI bill. Yeah, so inclusion is hugely important for any, in any society, and that means people being able to contribute fully to society, no matter what their gender, no matter what their belief system, their creed, their race, their sexual orientation. That's something that is a really strongly held value mm. of the British government. Um, the situation in Ghana, people in Ghana have different opinions from people in the UK, and I'm not going to sit here and tell Ghanaians what they should be thinking. 
Um, we work with various institutions in Ghana on a really wide variety of human rights issues. For example, we've been in touch with the women's rights organisations over the many years that they have been fighting to get the Affirmative Action Bill through Parliament and it's brilliant to see that they have finally succeeded and that act has come into, into law. Um, we've also had a, a good working relationship with the organisations who are involved in revoking the death penalty here in Ghana as well. So on very many of these issues there is strong alignment between the UK and Ghana. Mm. And uh, there's also Lord Collins who recently was in town. I believe this was his first stop as far as becoming Minister for Africa. Um, some find the portfolio pretty interesting. There's a minister for the continent of, of Africa. There's also right. a minister for the whole of the Middle East and North Africa. There's a minister for the whole of Asia <laughs> and the Pacific. So it's not only Africa that gets one minister for an enormous variety of countries. It, it's just a, out of curiosity. I mean, I've heard different comments. Oh, there's a minister for Africa. Okay, okay. Hopefully it comes with a lot more, you know, in terms of UK, Africa, um, relations, especially for the Commonwealth, members of the Commonwealth. But during his, his visit, and I believe you, you were a part of it, there were interactions with the Vice President, who's flag bearer of the New Patriotic Party, the ruling party, also with uh, former President John Dramani Mahama and Professor Jane Nano Pokwajman. Uh, what were your takeaways from those interactions ahead of the elections? Mm. So I won't go into the detail, of course, of the private conversations, um, but uh, the minister made points very similar to those that I've made now uh, around not having a favoured outcome. Um, but he was interested in what would be some of the key priorities uh, for the two candidates should they come into office. He was interested in their take of the process on the process as we were then a few months out from the elections. Um, what they were doing to ensure it would be a good process from their position as candidates. Obviously there are many more actors with a role to play in that. So those were some of the things that we touched on during those conversations. Well, so you did the matter of peace emerge at some point? Yeah, I mean peaceful elections is one of the priorities for any election around the world, so we did touch on that, yeah. Uh, both candidates uh, were committed to doing what they could to engender peaceful elections, as I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear. Not at all. Uh, speaking of which, now you've served in Ghana for a while, and I hope uh, you're going to be here for a while longer. I hope so. What are your, your hopes when it comes to serving in this role, in this capacity, and UK-Ghana relations moving forward? That's a really big question. I mean... Uh, whoever succeeds me will, I'm sure, feel that same sense of privilege that I have felt in this role. Um, the breadth of our relationship uh, from economy and, and uh, commercial relationship through to the partnership that we have with defence and other security agencies, uh, the partnerships that we have when it comes to human development, education, health, social inclusion, um, across that huge breadth of activity, there are uh, enormous strengths and the, the collaboration goes well beyond government. There are so many fantastic things happening that neither government has got any hand in. We might congratulate people, we might wish them well, but these things are happening regardless of us. And my hope is that all of that will continue to grow over the years to come and that the UK will remain a part of Ghana's success story and Ghana will remain a part of the UK's success story. I have no doubt that that is what's going to happen and that is my strongest hope for the future. And that's brilliant. I wish you the best on that journey. Thank you. Let's, let's go back to the King's birthday party. And um, like I said, it's the 14th. It's going to be marked here on the 7th, which is today, actually. But what, what, what is the plan? Um, what's going to happen today? How is it going to be celebrated? And um, so it'll be like, it what, will, what can we expect? It will feel like a party. At least that's our, that's our hope. It's going to be a party. We are inviting uh, many of our most important partners and stakeholders. And we hope that they will have a jolly good time. Uh, 
uh, they will be enjoying food from the Ghana food movement, a, uh, a fusion of Ghanaian and British food. They will be enjoying entertainment from young Ghanaian entertainers, musicians and dancers, the Fra Band and the DWP uh, Dance Academy. Uh, and they will be treated to a fashion th show by three young Ghanaian uh, designers who are promoting sustainable fashion, so Kakao, Ajabeng and uh, The Revival. So yeah, we're very much hoping people are going to come along, hopefully make some new friends, some new connections and have a very good time celebrating His Majesty King Charles III and the strong and enduring partnership between the UK and Ghana. There's well, something I love that I know you love too. Can you guess? Is it chocolate? See, si, chocolate. chocolate. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> I guess I well. But what, what type do you like? Dark or Dark. milk chocolate? Dark. Why? The one that's not too sweet. Yeah. Okay, so you like it because it's not too sweet. Yeah. Yeah, okay. exactly. But it also has more health benefits. Apparently so. And I wish I could hand on heart tell you that's why I like it. But no, I like it because <laughs> yeah, it tastes like good. It. I see. Uh, you've told me about your taste in food and all of that. But a little bird whispered to me that you also have a wagashi kind oh, of... Oh, I you do, know, yeah. I, mean, I hear in Tamale you had quite an experience with it. Yeah, so whenever I head to the north, the team know that they need to build in a little extra time in our journeys because we'll oh. be on the lookout for the wagashi sellers at the side of the road and we'll have to make a stop to get some because it always tastes best straight out of the pan. Yeah, fresh. Mm. Mm. I see. Curd milk fantasy. Delicious. Anyway, so that's it. But I'm going to wrap up with this last point. And I want you to answer me without thinking. When you think Ghanaian music, who comes to your mind first? King Promise first. I'll tell you oh, why. Wow. It's because okay. my daughters <laughs> still play Terminator. I mean, it's almost on repeat. They just, they, uh, uh, yeah. Like yeah. So if you come by the house at the weekend and look through the windows, you would see me and my daughters dancing to King Promise's Terminator around the house. Have you ever met him? Have they ever I met have him? I have met him actually, yeah, yeah. Okay. We're, we're birthday twins as it turns out. Oh, yeah. no surprises in there. <laughs> it's been refreshing talking to you uh, today on the, the occasion of the King's birthday, which is a week away, but which we are celebrating uh, today. Any final words? No, just thank you for a great conversation. Nice meeting you. It's been a pleasure. And this has been my engagement with Harriet Thompson, the UK's High Commissioner to Ghana. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I've got to know a thing or two. And if I ever have to play music for her, I'll know to look for King Promise and specifically Terminator. Well, <laughs> this is where we terminate the conversation. My name is Benjamin Akapo. Thank you for watching. Welcome back, this is the AM Show, and as we cap off our conversations, we're going to be talking about the Strategic ESG and Sustainability Impact Summit, SESI for short. And joining me in the studio to have a conversation, I have Hilda Aku Asiedu. She's a member of the SESI Organizing Committee, and we also have joining the conversation, Isaac Edujemfi is head of the SESI Organizing Committee. Lady, gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Uchichi mm. mm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's, let's kick start the conversation. What, what is SESI? What's the ESG? Okay. Let, a brief talk about it. I, I just want our viewers to understand what it's all about. I'll start with you, Isaac. So SESI is a Strategic ESG and Sustainability Impact Summit. Okay. And then ESG is, is the environmental, social, and governance aspects of the summit. Okay. So ESG is a framework that is used to sort of check how companies are doing in terms of sustainability. Okay. And then the summit is, uh, is a premier platform we are creating to unite business leaders, policy makers, and sustainability experts mm. you know, to sort of uh, discuss challenges with regards to ESG and sustainability. I see. And, and for you, Aku. Um, Hi. Organizing this, why is it important for businesses? Okay, so um, 
like my colleague said, um, a lot of the um, investors are now looking at how organizations or companies are being sustainable in their operations. Mm. Yes, that's why... Sustainability is key. Yeah, it's mm. key. So for businesses, this workshop, this summit is going to help them bring them together with policymakers so that we can dialogue. There will be workshops and panel discussions and keynote speeches to be able to help businesses align with these ESGs and these um, sustainability goals that we hope to achieve, yes. All right, and if you look, Isaac, at this year's theme, um, towards a net zero future for businesses, and we all know that where the world is going and pollution and climate change and everything, you want to be, if you want to be sustainable, net zero uh, is the future. But can you elaborate on what this means in the context of Ghana and Ghanaian businesses? Okay, so the net zero future for businesses underscores the, the urgent need for companies, especially the private sector, you know, to make the effort to try and reduce their carbon footprint. Mm. You know, we, we, we have all heard about what is happening in other countries in terms of climate change, mm. how the heat on the surfaces of the, of the, of the ocean, the seas, is what drives or gives energy to these hurricanes yeah. and with the impact they're having. Yeah. So one way or the other, if you are able to you know, make the deliberate attempt to try and reduce our, our emissions, that is uh, the greenhouse gases we emit into the atmosphere with, through our, our operations and our activities. We believe that you know, achieving the sustainability you know, agenda in terms of uh, uh, our effects on the environment is something that is, that is really you know, achievable. Mm -hmm. Ghana, for instance, we, we, we are part of the, company, the countries that have signed the Paris the Agreement, Paris Agreement yeah. where we have made certain commitments to to try and contribute to achieving the, the, the net zero uh, <coughs> agenda. And as, as, as part of our, our commitments, we are supposed to reduce our emissions as a, as a nation, or as a country, uh, by 2060. And government alone, although they went to sign this agreement, cannot you know, do this. It can't be done by government alone. It requires the, 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 the efforts of the private sector, since uh, it is a driving force you know, of, of, of the economy. So we believe that uh, talking about it, coming up with uh, practical ways to ensure companies you know, can be aligned with achieving this goal, uh, I, I think is the best. And, and for you, why is it important to build the capacity of businesses as far as ESG is concerned? And yeah. how will SESI 2024 help address that? Yes, so um, in terms of building capacity, like ESG has been in existence for a long time. I think the first time it was mentioned was in 2004 when the United Nations met and then they, there was a report. And since then it's, it's been there, but I think now it's gaining a lot of prominence. And so we, we want to draw more attention to it. And through those workshops, we would make sure that we, we teach these organizations or we help these organizations align with um, what ESG is about, how they can impact the environment, how they can be sustainable in their operations, how they can um, set up corporate governances that would make sure that they are doing the right thing and they are, they are com contributing to the net zero emissions. Yeah. I'd like to add something. To yes, yes, yes. Go so, ahead. so in terms of importance, uh, we believe that people need the, the, the requisite knowledge, you know, in terms of understanding to do what is, what is needed for us to be able to achieve the impact that we need. Mm. And uh, sustainability and ESG is a bit technical. So you, you, you require that uh, practical skill and ability mm -hmm. in terms of knowledge and understanding to be able to make the right decisions. Mm. You know, sometimes people do what we call greenwashing. Mm -hmm. A lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. So we want to veer away from that, but rather have people know what they are talking about, know what they are doing in terms of sustainability and ESG. Mm -hmm. and we believe that the only way to do this is to you know, create the avenues where people can build their knowledge, build their capacity to be able to make the right decisions when it comes to sustainability and ESG. Okay, I'll, I'll stay with you because you also have a, yeah. a forest sustainability initiative as part of SESI 2020. Uh, for you mean to plant what 10,000 10, trees, trees in two years? Yes. Uh, 
how exactly will SESI 2024 drive that and how, walk us through how you're going to achieve that? What, are, what is the plan? Okay, so we've acquired uh, some acres of land and one of the plants is where that every the journalist in me wants to probe <laughs> where in Shy Hills. Shy Hills. Okay. And uh, as part of the the, the, the plans for the Sesi summit, each participant of the summit is going to plant a tree as okay. their commitment, you know, towards uh, reducing emissions. Okay. So the the date will be announced during the summit where we will all converge and then take up this exercise. We are also encouraging. Uh, corporate bodies to, you know, adopt some of these, these uh, acres of the land and then, you know, uh, help us uh, achieve, achieve the target. It's, it's, it's 10,000 trees in two years is, uh, seems big, but then yeah. we believe that with corporate companies coming on board, we can, we, we, we can, we can easily... What, what types of trees are you hoping to plant? Okay, so we have, we have what we call the thick, there's a, there's a, tree, a type of tree called thick trees. Thick. Thick, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, since uh, uh, by research, they, they, they happen to do a lot of the absorption the, or the, they say the sinking of the gases. I see. So we, we look at planting more of those trees. Mm. Uh, let me come back to you. So what exactly is this green manifesto matrix? And, okay. you know, there you, you are looking at the political leaders, political mm -hmm. elements mm -hmm. as well. What's the agenda? Yeah, so the matrix is just in, in simple terms to make sure that these policymakers are aligned with the commitments and the strategies uh, so far as net zero emissions are concerned. So um, we are looking, like he said, during the Paris Agreements, the government signed, were part of the people who signed that um, peace agreement. And because they can't do it alone and we need the private sector, we hope to bring them together and to make sure that they are able, the government is able to align with what the private sector is also doing. And the private sector will also understand the policies that are also in place by the government to be able to achieve the um, emission that we hope to reduce and reduce the global temperature by um, 105 degrees by 2030. Mm. So basically that's, that's um, what we look to, to, to do with the um, global metrics. When I hear talk about temperature, I read a lot about yeah. around these things and you'd see that Animals are getting affected. We ourselves are getting yeah. affected with rising tides. I mean, yeah. polar bears are losing a yeah. lot of their habitat. So many animals are affected. Exactly. I mean, every, every, every bit, even plants are getting affected. But when you talk about the strategies of yeah. governments or their policies, the elections are right around the corner. Yeah. Are you speaking to these political elements ahead of the elections, for example, so that the impact will be felt whichever party comes to power, the impact will be felt in how they, they govern? Well, well, I think the ESG is, the timing is strategic because if we are talking about um, net zero emissions and um, sustainability and the likes, I think is, is, is the right time in looking at the fact that we are going to the polls very soon. And these businesses or organizations would, would get to understand what um, it is, the consequences and the dye effects that it has on, on them as a business, yes. Mm. Okay, let me come to you now, Isaac. Uh, the summit will focus on a number of things, the circular economy, decarbonization, among others. Tell us about the focal areas of the summit. So, uh, the focal area is decarbonization. Okay. So we believe that uh, it presents a lot of challenges, but at the same time, a lot of opportunities. Um, we have the, 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 the aspect of looking at renewable energy, uh, the EV, EV transportation systems, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all these require a lot of initial sort of investments or financing, I may say. Sometimes it's, it's not easy to come by <laughs> these things, uh, in these times. Right. But we believe that it also creates the market for, for industries or for, 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 for companies to you know, create jobs. That have anywhere we can, we can expand and create employment and also you know, have people come and invest in our, in our, in our economy. Mm. So, it is one of the, the key, key areas that we want to focus on mm -hmm. at, the, at the summit. Uh, advocating for companies to adopt, you know, gradually sort of integrate the <coughs> renewable energy into their systems. We're not saying that they should just move away from fossil fuel or something, but 
gradually try and integrate it. It's not going to be a, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, a process that Rome wasn't built in a day, exactly. but gradually you want them to get there. Exactly. Yeah. Beyond SESI 2024, what do you hope the impact of this, this summit will be on businesses? So we want to have a lasting impact, you know, a culture where sustainability and ESG is well embedded in the core business models of, of, of so it's integrated in yes. how they operate, they operate and, and also to to help them put them in a strategic position to for investments because a lot of these um, big financing um, organizations are looking at companies that are heavily you know investing in esg so if yes. they get to understand and they get to operate <clears throat> then they it puts them at an advantage position as how, an how will you know the outcomes of the summit how will it shape these businesses? How will it shape your work moving forward? Well, for us, it's and, going and, to and be... And if I may add, how do you hope to sustain it as well? Yes. So, SESI is a, is a, is a maiden edition. Mm -hmm. We hope that going forward, we'll have a um, series of these um, events and workshops being organized to continually train them to help them, to help us know that whatever that mm. we're doing is, is creating the impact it wants. And for us, it's going to be very good for us as an organ organizing um, um, organization, you know, putting this together because we will see the impact. We will see um, how our environment is, you know, reducing, we are reducing the carbon emissions and all the greenhouse gases. It's going to be good for us as a nation because then we know that we are contributing to the carbon footprint and then we are keeping our parts of the agreement assigned. Um, and you're going to monitor the outcomes? Right? Yes, we will monitor the outcomes. What, what message do you have for businesses, especially in, in this light? Okay, so we'll say that for businesses still staying on the fence, not seeing sustainability as... The, the Humpty uh, Dumpty end. <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know, sustainability, we believe, <clears throat> is, is the pathway to profitability. Okay. So we we'll encourage that uh, they, they join in, you know, on the campaign and then start playing active roles so that they can also equally enjoy, you know, the benefits of what, what, what we are talking about. Mm. You know, we want everybody to have that impact. That, that, that they, are just, they are supposed to have, and be part of those contributing to a better, a better world, a better planet uh, at the end of the day. All right. So my final question to you both, final thoughts. Um, this net zero agenda is one that we must all embrace. Yeah. Your summit is pushing it. How can the public, how can civil society, how can we in the media push it, help you push this agenda? I'll start with you, Hilda. Okay, so for me, um, I think the media, um, we will need the publicity, we will need the platforms, we will need the conversations to go on. Um, we don't want to um, be the only ones steering or you know, spearheading these conversations. We want um, the public to also understand um, some of these um, critical um, conversations. When we talk about sustainability, we know that Ghana, uh, when we take about 10 people, you have about five people you know, hearing about sustainability and ESG and this. So we want the education to go very far, wide, so that everybody can understand and come on board. What's interesting, this whole agenda also fit, fits into the SDGs. Mm -hmm. But yes. anyway, final thoughts, Isaac. So uh, we believe that with the influence of the media, uh, prioritizing, you know, reporting on some of these things, I think would, would give it the, the, the far reach that it needs. Okay. We also believe that when we share in, in the awareness of what uh, the good people are doing, uh, I think it will also encourage others to, to, to do the same. So we would, we would, we would want the, the media to, you know, uh, in terms of reporting, you know, prioritize reporting issues on, on sustainability the more yeah. to, to, okay. to encourage uh, everybody coming on board. Don't worry, we are solidly behind you. And uh, you. This, is, this is a mission that is for all of us. It's not for just one group. But that is uh, SESI. It's all about SESI 2024 the Strategic ESG and Sustainability Impact Summit 2024. Those who join me for a conversation, Hilda Aku Esiedu, member, SESI Organizing Committee, and Isaac Edujemfi, head of the SESI Organizing Committee. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having us. And this is how we conclude our conversation this morning on the AM Show. But you know there's that topical issue of Parliament reconvening, and we'll leave you, as we cap off the AM Show, with footage, scenes from... 
uh, Parliament and that expected sitting today. Up next after that, join News Desk. Do stay. To all members of Parliament, I'm privileged.